March means one thing. Basketball, basketball, basketball. Did you know that college players born in North Dakota are historically the most accurate three-point shooters? The NCAA is using Google Cloud to turn data into insights, and so can your business. See how at g.co slash March Madness. Google Cloud, the official cloud of the NCAA. It was BYOG, bring your own guts. This is the best, the best Do you hear me? of the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Welcome to the day after the day after the college basketball season has ended. I know you wanted to say finally ended, didn't you? Welcome to Tuesday. We have a lot to do on the program. We'll talk to an SEC head football coach a little bit later on. You may have heard of him. And we will take your phone calls at 855-242-7285. So as the game ended last night, were you awake? I wasn't. Stuart Mandel from... The Athletic tweeted, okay, it's football season. Thank you, Stuart. We actually agree with you. So it is on. It was a, it was a good basketball season, but it's over. And in Alabama, they're not happy about spring practice. Why? Too many players from both Alabama and Auburn are getting hurt. Why is that? We'll talk about it later on, but that is certainly... A concern as spring practice ends in some places this weekend and goes on for another two weeks in others, including Alabama for that matter. Often overlooked, Kyle Trask, now viable contender in Florida's QB competition. Who isn't a contender? A topic that we will slice and dice. Meanwhile, Jimbo Fisher says everyone is still in the running, including you. For the Aggies QB battle. It's a good one and it's important. And we'll talk about it this afternoon. And Kirby Smart, remember him? Daryl said yesterday he's the best coach in the country. Nick Saban has not seconded that emotion. For Kirby Smart, size of George's O-line isn't a big deal. Nothing's a big deal when you're Kirby Smart. Life is good. Life is good for us as well, we say hello to you again on this Tuesday. Uh, just as uh, we were thinking about the end of football season, we'll talk to Dennis Dodd, get his take on the uh, upcoming year and a couple of NCAA by- bylaws that may be changed. Matt Luke, he's the head coach at Ole Miss, and Jason Kersey from the uh, Athletic. He's covering the Razorbacks. What about John Chavis? Will this landing in Fayetteville be better than the last one, which is more like a crash? And, of course, your phone calls. And you know the number, 855-242-7285. Yesterday the calls were off the charts. Today let's try to get them back in the road. 855-242-7285. That is our number. We begin in Starkville. Cade is up on the line, and you are first up. Hello, Cade. Hey, Paul. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, you know, as dominant as Georgia was last year, do you think uh, they can get back and be that good again this year? Well, I think they can get to the SEC championship game. Right now, I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I'm willing to to go with Georgia getting to the to the Final Four or the college football playoff, but I think they're very good, and And I think uh, their schedule is even uh, more attractive. Really, uh, I don't see a lot of trouble on the schedule. You can pick and choose. I mean, I've already stated uh, South Carolina is a dangerous game. Is Missouri? Who knows? At LSU could be tricky. Yeah. Beyond that, Auburn at home is always dangerous. I mean, I see three or four tough games, but nothing, nothing like what they had to deal with last year by uh, going to South Bend the second weekend in a row with a freshman – with second week of the year with a freshman quarterback. Right. Uh, so, you know, they, it's like it's no secret. They also have talent on defense. What do you think about their defense? you think they can be as dominant as they were last year? The Georgia defense? They can be the defensive guy. So, um, yeah. You know, I don't know how. Um, when you when you lose Smith and you lose so many other players, I mean, I, I don't have any right, doubt they'll hurt. be good. But uh, I, I, I am not sold that Georgia is going to be the same team next year. Uh, I think they'll be very good primarily because the East is weak. But uh, I, I think they will come back a, a fraction. A fraction, what does that mean? Does that mean 
Uh, does that mean they'll lose a game or two more? I, I don't know, but I think the, I think they're they're a ten win team at least. But I'm not I, I, right now. I wouldn't predict them to make the uh, the top four. Thanks for the call. Appreciate it. Eight five five two four two seven two eight five. Let's go to Bubba up next. Paul, what's going on today? Good, Bubba. Listen, uh, I'm flying out tomorrow to uh, Dallas, and uh, I'm going to go see Jimbo and visit with him and look for a place to live. But when I'm out there, I'm going to walk on, uh, try to, I'm going to see if I can try out for the Cowboys. I'm only 46, and I think I could make the team. That's great, Bubba. We're really, really interested in your uh, your personal life. Uh, Brandon is up next. I mean, this guy calls every day. Um, I mean, I, I kind of, I was kind of, I kind of went along with him until he starts talking about trying out for the Cowboys. I mean, it's, it's great that he knows Jimbo. It's great that he and Jimbo have a hunting preserve together. Uh, it's great that he said that Jimbo was going to beat Alabama yesterday or Clemson. But I think I've had enough. Uh, let's go to Brandon next. Uh, how are you, Brandon? Doing pretty good, Paul. How you doing? We're doing great. Uh, i got a quick question. I was going to get your take on two things. Uh, the first thing, I know you probably touched on it a little bit yesterday, was the uninterrupted and the whole LeBron uh, – the box with the shop talk thing. And then my other question was, um, I'm kind of curious on your thoughts as uh, Derek Dooley in the offensive coordinator position at Missouri. And I hope you have a great day, but thank you very much. You know, on the, uh, I don't know all the facts of the LeBron squabble. To me, it seems pretty minor. Uh, I think Alabama will rectify whatever they need to rectify. How it got to this point. I don't know. Uh, I'm sure LeBron is, uh, has people that do things like that. I doubt he's, uh, you know, at halftime uh, in the locker room going over his legal issues. As far as uh, Derek Dooley, I actually think it's a, it's a good it's a good hire. Uh, I've heard really good things about Dooley being in Missouri for about four days earlier in the month. Uh, I heard uh, positive, positive comments, and I think uh, give Derek credit. Uh, he, uh, he took quite a tumble after Tennessee. He landed in Dallas, and, and I think he is now back in the SEC and and has, gained, and has garnered a lot of respect. Uh, kudos to him. Thank you for the call. Appreciate it. Let's uh, move along and talk to Dylan up next. What do you say, Dylan? Hey, Paul. Um, first-time caller, big-time listener. I was just asking, uh, being here in East Tennessee, there's big talks about Randy Sanders and this somewhat allegations of him hitting a football player. Right. I mean, you see it all the time, just put coaches, like, trying to get their players pumped up and whatnot, and I wanted to hear your thoughts about it. Well, I mean, I, I don't really know the all the all the mitigating circumstances. To me, uh, it it's something that's either uh, egregious or they can get by with. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know where it lands. Um, is there uh, a lot of physicality that goes on between football coaches and players? Yeah. Um, but it just depends on whether this was uh, something that he was doing uh, in the moment or whether this was uh, unprovoked. And I do not know the answer to that. Thanks for the call. I really appreciate it. Uh, Randy Sanders, certainly a great uh, re- resume uh, being a Tennessee quarterback, Tennessee qu- and, and Kentucky coordinator. Uh, Jason in New York. Uh, Jason, go right ahead. Uh Good afternoon, Paul. A uh, big fan of your show. I'm a first-time caller. Oh, I thank you. Part, I kind of have a two-part question. First thing first, um, being that the SEC is the cream of the crop of college football, um, I follow a team like LSU a lot. What do you think is the status of Ed Orgeron's job security? Well, I don't think there, there's any issue right now with uh, Coach O. Uh, I think people in Louisiana really like him. I think he has the support of the administration. I think the uh, end of the season was uh, disappointing, and I think I think the whole uh, Steve Ensminger hire uh, turned some people off. Uh, everyone who was excited a year ago about Matt Canada's hire as offensive coordinator were disillusioned, I think, when he elevated someone who seems to be a little out of touch with uh, at least the modern Internet. Um, but if he's comfortable uh, with Ensminger, and he is, then that, that should be his prerogative. And, it, and if it works, then he will be successful. If, it, if the offense completely co- continues to stutter, then Ogeron will then, uh, I think, find the wrath of the fans on, on his footstep, on his uh, doorsteps, don't you? 
I, I absolutely agree. Last question. Being that Georgia had the amazing showing they did under Kirby Smart last year, with, even though they lost in the national championship, would you say that this season Georgia is the best and favorite team coming out of the entire SEC? No, I wouldn't say that, Jason. Uh, and listen, I know Alabama loses uh, six or seven uh, major draft choices every year, but I, I still believe Alabama is more complete overall. I think Georgia is losing some great players, and, and I think Kirby has the players now on campus to replace them, but it's just how quickly he can get them acclimated in spring and, and, and in fall drills. Uh, I, I don't think a year from now there'll, there'll be a dime's worth of difference between Alabama and Georgia, but I think this year there may be a little bit. Uh, and I say that because he has recruited so well. Uh, we are going to take a break. More of your phone calls at 855-242-7285. We're coming right back. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Welcome back uh, to the program. Your phone calls at 855-242-7285. Joe is up next. Good afternoon, Paul. How y'all doing today? Wonderful. Well, that's great. I'd like to say uh, a couple of comments. Oh, well, one I'd like to say first, because it has to do with you, Paul, uh, went to church, you know, Easter Sunday, and there was a couple of guys that, you know, long-time church members, uh, Carl Louie and my old high school football coach, Jimmy Mayfield, but they both listen and actually record your show and listen to it every day. Oh, how cool. And so those are those are two big fans of yours. Everybody in Red Bay loves you, Paul. But I'd like to mention this ball game last night. I'm, uh, you know, Villanova started off a little bit slow, but, they, you know, they showed that they were clearly, you know, the best team in the country. And Michigan, I'm not really going to poke fun at them. I'm going to give them condolences, but they had a good year, Paul. And now they can look forward to, you know, going on to football, paying that over, overpaid coach of theirs to, that can't even win his conference. And they can move on and look forward to that now, Paul. And I, something I want to ask you about A-Day you know, the A-Day games that's coming. Do you know who's going to be at the Alabama game with the SEC Network? Uh, yeah, the, the, the Alabama game will actually be on ESPN. And I think it's going to be uh, Herb Street, uh, Joey Galloway. Uh, I, I think same same crew that, we, that did it last year. I'm not positive, but I think they will. Some, I think Kirk will be there. That's That's the one I know about. Well, if I see Kirk, I'll, I'll make sure I give him a big roll tide. Because I know how he feels about Alabama, but anyway, Paul, I love the show. Y'all doing good, and uh, I'm gonna get off here. Well, I don't, I don't know what. Uh, I, I'm not sure why anybody would be criticizing uh, Kirk uh, when it comes to Alabama. I think he's probably as uh, as supportive of Alabama as any, uh, and Nick Saban as any uh, broadcaster in the business. But anyway, people hear what they want to hear. Let's uh, check in with Michael in Georgia. Hello, Michael. Go right ahead. Hey, Paul. How you doing? Very well, thank you. Yeah, I'm a first time caller, a long time watcher, and um, I know how you feel about Jim Harbaugh. I'm a big Michigan fan, but I want to know how do you think if Shea Patterson is eligible? How does that? Well, make our listen, if Shea can uh, become eligible, uh, I do think Michigan will be a factor. I'm, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I joke about Harbaugh, but uh, I try to be, I try to keep it real, and uh, we all know his problem. It's he has not been able to develop the right quarterback, and right. to me, Shea Patterson is the right quarterback. What do you think about the new offensive line coach, Ed Warner? Um, Ed's got a good reputation. Uh, I've, he's, I've encountered him over the years. I think he is well thought of. So uh, it's not it's not the staff. I think uh, is the problem. It's just uh, it's been the development of, a, of an offensive philosophy that starts at the quarterback position. But but I will say again, if Shea Patterson is uh, is the quarterback, I think Michigan will be a contender this year in the Big Ten. All right, thanks, Paul. I enjoy Thank you. the show. Kind of blowing my cover there, but uh, that is the truth. Matt in San Antonio. What do you got, Matt? Well, I got Paul. I want to talk about the spring game coming up with uh, a and I heard it's going to be some celebrities. There's going to be former players. Who will the be game. there? Um, Steve McGee. Um, I can't remember all of them, but there's going to be some players that used to play at A&M at the game. Okay. And I was wondering is, to talk uh, is about... The, is the A&M game this week? Uh, or next week. The 14th. Week. The 14th. Next, next week, week on the 14th. Yeah, yeah 14th. it's next week. And I want to talk about what I want to see from this spring game is how can this team continue to get better with Jimbo where every time – you made a good point once, Paul, 
every time when it gets to October and November, we cannot close to finish the season strong. And why do you think that is, Matt? Well, before, under the previous coaching staff, we couldn't do that at all. I want to see if Jimbo Fisher can help this team get over that hump, Paul, where we can close in October and November and finish strong. Well, I think I think Jimbo is the right coach. Um, I believe he is the right coach, and I want to see a sample in the spring football game. How can we continue to get better under Jimbo Fisher, and how much progress we can make? I think I think the program's in good shape, Matt. Appreciate the call. Trey is up next in Tuscaloosa. Hello, Trey. Hey, Mister Fine. I'm have a question for you. We or a couple of questions. Is LeBron going to start holding up a sign? I want Bama, or we want Bama, like <laughs> everybody else does. I'm sure he will. <laughs> My question is going to be about SEC basketball. It was a great year, and we have some uh, good coaches and young players. Uh, but well, how would you rate how they did in the NCAA tournament? And, and I'll hang up and let you comment. And uh, y'all have a great day. Thank you. Well, uh, listen. Uh, I mean, I think. Uh, yeah, you know, it was it was it was uh, Bill Parcells who who once said, "You are what your record says you are." So, uh, if you're measuring uh, a league by by its its le- its its NCAA play, then uh, you had two teams that made it to the third round. I I think that would be a little short sighted uh, to to make a declaration on the SEC based on on March. I think the SEC and and we had Sean Farnham on here yesterday, far more of an expert than I am say that he thought this league uh, has come uh, light years ahead over the last two or three years. It's built on coaching. It's built on scheduling. It's, it's getting tough to prepare your, your in November and December to, for the conference play and what happens after that. Uh, the, the NCAA tournament, as we saw this year, is a game of chance. Uh, it's, a, it's, a Russian, it's Russian roulette. And uh, you know, Villanova, was, Villanova was was the best team in the country at the end. They were really one of the best two or three teams in the country all along, but they were able to survive while Arizona wasn't. Uh, Virginia couldn't get out of the first round. Uh, so many other teams failed. So I, I think it would be a mistake to uh, to let your last impression of this league uh, be cemented by what you saw in March because I, th- I frankly thought it was one of the better SEC basketball seasons we have uh, enjoyed in many, many years. That's what's important, uh, building it for the future. Thank you very much for the call. Richard in Florida, you are next up. Uh, how are you, Richard? I'm doing fine, Paul. Thanks for taking the call. Uh, listen, I don't hear anything about the Gators. We've got a new coach who does well with quarterbacks. We've got some talent. I think he's uh, cleaned up the locker room a little bit. I, I was wondering for your thoughts. I'll just get off the phone. Well, I'm a huge fan of Dan Mullen, and we've spoken to him and uh, talked about him in the uh, over the last couple of months. So, I, I, again, I'm you know one thing I always try to say: this is a four hour show every day, and people can come and go and, and miss. We we played a couple of segments from from Dan on Monday's show, uh, and we have talked about that uh, with Pat Dooley and others, and we'll continue to because I think I think Florida is going to be a major story in the SEC in the upcoming uh, year. Thank you for the call. Appreciate it. Don in uh, Iowa. Uh, actually, uh, Cedar Rapids. Uh, is that Michigan or Iowa? I can't, Iowa. I can't. Iowa. Grand Rapids is in Michigan. Yes. I, I got my I – didn't, I didn't do well in Midwest geography. How are you? Fine. Waiting for snow. Uh, doing well. Thank you. Why – now that the college basketball season is over, I've got a question. What two? There's only been two players in the college basketball that have won the NCAA, the NIT, and the NBA. Can you name either one of those? Oh, um... I know that Bill Russell did it uh, in the same uh, year. He also had an Olympic gold medal in there, but I don't know. But I'm, but I'm not sure I can give you a better answer than that. I'm talking about the NCAA, the NIT, and no, the NBA. Yeah, but I said Bill Russell. He, he won for uh, San Francisco uh, State, uh, then you know. uh, the U.S. gold, and then the Boston Celtics. I don't know. Who you got? Well, Tom Gola is one of them that I know of. Hmm. Remember Tom Gola? Yeah, he played for he played for Chicago. Played for the Val, and then he played for the 
Philadelphia Warriors. Yeah, obviously I didn't remember him very well. And he won the NCAA, the yeah. NIT, and the NBA in 1956. Yeah, I don't remember that. And he was stationed in Fort Dix, New Jersey, after he won the NBA in 56, when I was stationed at Fort Dix in the Army. How did you remember that is my question. I have to look it up. Oh, okay. On the Internet. So you don't think my Bill Russell answer is very impressive, huh? No. Yeah. No. Well, good. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, think, you're, I don't think your Tom. Go. I don't think your Tom Gullick answer is very. I mean, Bill Russell. Uh, he won the NCAA championship. He won a gold medal playing for his country, and he won the NBA championship in about a fourteen-month period. Is that not impressive? You're giving me. I'm giving you Bill Russell. And you're giving me Tom Golick, who won the NIT? I mean, am I missing something here? LaSalle? When did they start playing basketball? We'll take a short break. 56, everyone remember that year. Good year. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. You're not worth a clip. March means one thing. Basketball, basketball, basketball. Did you know that college players born in North Dakota are historically the most accurate three-point shooters? The NCAA is using Google Cloud to turn data into insights, and so can your business. See how at g.co slash March Madness. Google Cloud, the official cloud of the NCAA. And welcome back to our program. We will get more of your phone calls uh, at 855 242 Two eight five. Let's uh, go to Hambone, and you're on the air. Go right ahead, Hambone. How you doing, Mr. Feinbaum? We are doing well, thank you. Hey, Paul, I got a question for you. Do you think that Georgia is going to have as much talent this year as they did last year when we broke their heart? Uh, no, I don't. I mean, I think they'll be very good, but I think the talent will be much younger. Than I mean, you know, you're you're losing, uh, you know, two of the, the one of the best running back duos. In SEC history, you're losing Rokon Smith. I mean, that's just three players to start with. Um, I think it's going to be a transitional year, but I think because of the weakness of the SEC East, uh, Georgia will still be able to win it. Yes, I believe you're right, Paul. I'll agree with that. But we're going to see just how good a coach Kirby Smart, and I'm not trying to knock Kirby Smart. Hey, I have to ask Alabama. You're an Alabama fan, right? Absolutely, and I and I don't need that. We love Kirby Smart. I mean, I don't I don't want to hear all that. But what is this edge that I hear between Georgia fans and Alabama fans, and Alabama fans and Georgia fans? Because I mean, there's just I mean, are you really as nervous about Kirby Smart's success as I think you are? Me? Yeah, no, you, man, you, you, hit, you man. as an Alabama fan, about, are you nervous about, about nobody, Kirby Smart's Paul. success not only on the field? but especially in recruiting. Nick got who he wanted in recruiting. Didn't are you, are you, no, Hambone, are you serious? <laughs> are you really, I mean, you, you didn't, you didn't watch the, the, you did not watch the end of, you didn't watch the end of the recruiting? We quit recruiting right now and beat Georgia for the next five years. We quit recruiting right now today and beat Georgia for the next five years. You want to say that a few more times in case anybody missed it? No, but that's true, Paul. That's the truth, and you know it. Hmm. And you really are, and you, you're a knowledgeable football fan, and make that statement, right? Wow, I think he tucked in. Whew. Reverend Bishop is in Oklahoma. Hello, Paul. Salutations to you and your great staff and show. Uh, best show on TV other than live college football, right? How you doing, Rev? I'm doing good. Hey, I was going to mention something. That little old man called in a while ago about the player that won a NAIA, NIT, and NCAA as a player. Right. Well, we've got a legend in the SEC that did it as a coach. He's no longer coaching. And you know 
who I'm talking about, I'm sure, Paul, with your guru genius, uh, Nolan Richardson, uh, Coach Richardson, he he wanted as a coach the NAIA, the NIT, and the NCAA in beautiful Charlotte, North Carolina. He did, 1994. 94 with Big Nasty and and uh, Scotty Thurman and all of them. They, and they were back the next year, actually. But, Paul, it's been a dry spell there for a while, but I won't say nothing. Well, you know, they, they got, didn't, was, was, Hawks, didn't, but, didn't they get back to the championship game the following year? Yes, sir, and they had it They had it going, and they run into uh, all the old boy that end up at Georgia UCLA, for a little bit. UCLA, uh, uh, Herrick. Yeah, oh Herrick, he had some players, and they ended up getting us, Paul. But boy, it would have been sweet to got back to back. But what blessed me so was that over the course of time, everything was reconciled at the U of A between them and brother. Brother Nolan still lives over there, and he'll be there. Well, I'm sure he'll never leave. And him and Eddie Sutton and. And, and and President Clinton, uh, well, you know, had a big, you, uh, I've told the audience year anniversary here. You know, while Reverend, back, uh, and it, it just fun, bless my heart. Paul. It's funny, and I, I told the story maybe last summer, but I happened to see uh, President Clinton. Uh, it was last May. I ran into him. I mean, it's not like I just ran into him on the street. I ran into him somewhere else, um, and uh, we had this mo- the most incredible conversation. And the majority of the conversation concerned that 94 Final Four, which he was at as the president, as you remember. Yes, sir. And uh, he, he, he went into chapter and verse about that Final Four. I mean, he, I, mean, you, you, uh, I mean, everyone knows uh, the president's reputation, of course, as far as being an engaging conversationalist. But, he is uh, an excellent man, and he, he, he is was a, a conversationalist. It was, it was stunning to sit there and listen to him talk about that, that, that weekend in Charlotte. Oh, I didn't get to go, Paul, of course, but I, I, I was working at 3M then before I answered the call to ministry, and and my boss said, go, Hack, go, and because uh, we got the first games in uh, Oklahoma City, believe it or not, and then the second games was in Dallas. And uh, But I couldn't get over to Charlotte, but, boy, I, sh- I sure remember those days. And, you know, no, uh, Brother uh, Coach Richardson – is the only coach that I know of still to this day that's done that, Brother Paul. I don't, I don't know if any other coach that's won it at every level like that. Well, I don't think that many really have been at that many levels. But, hey, listen, thank you. It's always great to hear from you, Reverend. Uh, a pleasure. Chester is in Pittsburgh, and you are next up. Uh, how are you, Chester? Okay. Go right ahead. Okay, I was talking about uh, Tom Goldie. A gentleman talked about in 1956, I think the NIT, yeah, and Bill Russell. Well, everybody knows that Bill Russell is one of the best have ever played the game, and he was uh, with San Francisco in college. But Tom Goldie, if I'm not mistaken, and I, this is what I want to be cleared up on, uh, Tom Goldie, in my explanation and remembering. He was uh, really uh, got his fame because he beat um, old Wilt Chamberlain in the NIT. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yes, I, I, I'm pretty sure now. I'm not. I'm not going to say that. Uh, uh, I'm certain, maybe, but I'm, I'm pretty sure <clears throat> that. Uh, that was he was famous. Tom Goley was a good player, but I think his fame came when uh, I forget the team that uh, uh, Wilt played for, but they beat they beat him in the NIT. Now I'm not sure, and I want to see if uh, well, Will Will uh, Wilt, uh, well, Wilt played for Kansas. Um, Kansas, yeah, yes. Yes, and he and they were favored to beat. Right, and uh, I just wanted to know if I'm correct. I, I could not. I could be wrong. Yeah, we'll, we'll I, double check that. Uh, hey, listen, thank you very much, Chester. Always good to hear from uh, folks up in Pittsburgh. We are heading uh, for a break here. More, plenty more to come. We got uh, 
three and a half hours to go. We hope you'll participate at 855-242-7285 a Tuesday, and uh, we are up and running. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Welcome back uh, to the program. Uh, for those who missed it a minute ago, we had Hambone, die in the world Crimson Tide fan, just totally dismissing Georgia, saying Kirby, uh, Alabama could beat them, wouldn't have to recruit for the next five years. Uh, Nathan, go right ahead. Uh, I appreciate you taking my call, Paul. First time caller. I listen every day on my way to work. Love Thank you very much. Um, the statement that Hambo made, uh, he does not speak for all Alabama fans. I am an Alabama fan, lifelong for my short 26 years so far on this earth. <laughs> um, the statement he made may be the dumbest thing I have ever heard. Um, I don't know what, what everyone's surprised about, to be honest. Kirby Smart uh, was an excellent coordinator at his time at the University of Alabama. Uh, I think he made us much better uh, than we could have been with other coordinators. And, and I may be wrong, but I believe at one point in time he was the highest, if not one of the highest paid coordinators in the country. He probably um, was the highest. Not just for his his defensive skills uh, and his knowledge of the game defensively, but for his ability to recruit. So as an Alabama fan, the time that we enjoyed him at the University of Alabama, I don't understand why everybody is so shocked that Georgia came away with a top the top recruiting class in the country this year. Um, and, and to make the statement that for the next five years uh, we could just dismiss Georgia or anybody else for that matter is has got to be one of the dumbest things I have ever heard. Uh, Georgia is set to be a contender, I think. Uh, I agree with you. You know, they're going to be younger next year. Uh, but Georgia will be a threat and continue to be a threat with Kirby Smart at the helm. Um, I respect his coaching ability. You have to. And uh, the things he has done at the University of Georgia just over the last uh, year, a couple of years, have been nothing short of impressive. Nearly won the national championship, but I don't need to tell you that, Nathan, being an Alabama fan. Hey, thank you for the call. Listen, uh, I think I touched a nerve with him, and uh, I, no one sitting here or anywhere uh, is going to be uh, dismissive of Nick Saban. But I promise you, if you go inside the uh, inner sanctum, at Alabama, at Alabama, uh, they're they're worried about Georgia recruiting. They they know what Kirby's capable of, and head to head, Kirby beat Saban on a number of players during recruiting, and at the end. And I think that's why the ham bones of the world just don't even want to hear about Georgia. Uh, they they don't want to they, they don't want to think about Georgia, and that's why he he walked into the wall there with that. Truly regrettable statement. Uh, thank you for the call. Appreciate it. Stephen is up next. Uh, Stephen, go right ahead. Hey, um, I believe not only is Georgia going to be a concern for Alabama, but in the next few years, Tennessee is going to be a concern. Yeah, you could be right. Because Jeremy Pruitt knows how Saban is. He knows how Kirby is. And I believe Tennessee and Georgia in the east with Dan Mullen – this could go back to the early '90s and have a three-way yeah, I mean, I mean, three-way run. Yeah, I mean Nick Saban is no longer up against Mark Rick, someone he knows he could beat or he knew he could beat, and Butch Jones, who let's be honest, Saban didn't ever lose a wink of sleep. I mean he's got. I mean let's expand it. I mean he's got Jimbo Fisher to the west, someone he he knows is capable. He has Jeremy at Tennessee. He has Kirby at Athens. He knows that Gus Malzahn can recruit. And uh, Dan Mullen in Florida. I mean, this league is much trickier than it used to be for Nick Saban. Well, and when Saban was hired at Alabama, it flipped the SEC. It made every team look at the way they were playing and decide, do we want to compete with Alabama or do we not want to compete with Alabama? And the East... Yeah, when you, when you, Stephen, if if you think about all the hires, um, not all of them, but most of them were, uh, most of them have been in direct correlation to Alabama. Certainly Kirby Smart, certainly Jeremy Pruitt, certainly Jimbo Fisher. I mean, Dan Mullen was a natural. He, it had very little to do with Saban. It had everything to do with Dan Mullen and his familiarity, uh, in Gainesville. Yes. But, I believe Tennessee and Georgia, given time, yeah, Dan will do great at Florida, but I believe the competitive 
the competitiveness that Kirby and Jeremy have being with Saban and that rubbing off on them, I believe in the next five years it's going to be Tennessee and Georgia either flip-flopping for the next probably and, six or seven years. By the, uh, thanks. And by the way, I forgot another Saban disciple who's at South Carolina. I mean, the, they, this is a different league. And, yeah, I mean, there's you know, it's, it's TBD at Ole Miss at – at Texas, at, uh, at at Arkansas, uh, Mississippi State, uh, we don't know what the future looks like at LSU. But e- even if all those either are, are successful or unsuccessful, uh, the, the the names we've just mentioned are enough of a of a threat to Nick Saban to at least keep somebody up a half a minute. Uh, rather than Hambone being dismissive entirely. Thank you for the call. Todd is in Austin. You're on the air. Go right ahead. Yeah. How you doing, Paul? Hey there. Uh, I haven't listened in a while for, but uh, with Jimbo Fisher, who do you think has the inside track, or has there been any talk about quarterback there at A&M? Uh, um, we don't know, uh, Todd. I mean, that is one of the big mysteries of the of the spring, and there are many. Uh, there are two or three candidates, and, and Jimbo has not played his hand yet. Uh, we still have another week and a half, and even when uh, the spring game is over, I still don't think we'll know. We'll have a better idea, but we won't know. Yeah, and and one you know, that's and one other thing, you know, people keep calling, you know, saying, you know, how about a And M finishing the deal, finishing, you know, this a And M finishing the deal goes all the way back to the Big Twelve, where you know they blow big leads to Texas Tech, and I mean. At some point, it's got to change. Well, you know, but sometimes years, it, years it also has to do with the, it has to do with the schedule as well. Uh, there was a time when Alabama uh, was late. Now Alabama's early. I mean, LSU's always there. It, it's 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 just a wear and tear. But but you're right. What happened ten years ago shouldn't be correlative to today. But uh, it seems like it is. We'll take a break. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Put a little cherry on the top. March means one thing. Basketball, basketball, basketball. Did you know that college players born in North Dakota are historically the most accurate three-point shooters? The NCAA is using Google Cloud to turn data into insights, and so can your business. See how at g.co slash marchmadness. Google Cloud, the official cloud of the NCAA. It was me, why would you bring your own guts? This is the best best of the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. And we welcome all of you. Hour number two is live and ready to go. And we have a lot to do on this uh, program. Let's head to Mississippi and welcome in Matt Luke. Uh, I'm, I'm tempted to always refer to him as the new coach, but he's no longer the new coach. <laughs> coach, good afternoon. Hey, Paul. How you doing? I know you're, uh, you, you know, you, you're, you, you're the coach. You're not anything else other than that. And, uh, <laughs> but you are going through your first spring as the head coach. Right. And uh, tell us how it's gone. No, it's going good. You know, I think uh, we got a lot of guys coming back, that have a lot of experience, and so that that's been good. It's been good to see Jordan Tamu, you know, interact with the receivers and the O line. You know, when he walks on the field, it's his team. That's that's been really fun to watch. And of course, uh, the spring game this weekend. Uh, I, I know for fans, uh, and we get it here all the time. You know, what does this mean? Who's starting? All, all the questions that probably don't concern coaches as much as trying to see improvement. But when you set out a game plan for the spring and you get to the scrimmage, uh, what are you hoping to gain from that day? Well, you know, I think the biggest thing is I think in, in a lot of spots, there's some guys that are trying, we're trying to get experience. We're trying to get some young guys better. We want, obviously, to get out of there with no injuries. That That's what's going to be on my mind is making sure we get – get some guys some snaps and get them out of there without without getting injured but I think getting the young players that provide depth to your team I think that's where spring practice is really important and coach I want to ask you about that we showed a headline here earlier uh, from a couple other schools in the SEC about uh, serious injuries uh, ACLs a lot of a lot of issues and I, and I know that a football player can 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 pull something or tear something virtually doing anything we all know that but how do you keep that in mind as you head to spring? Because you, you certainly, uh, of all play, I mean, if you lose a player in a game during the season, you just accept that to be part of the reality. But is there anything you can do to avoid it? Uh, you know what? I, I don't. I don't think that you can avoid all the injuries. You know, unfortunately, in our game, that, that that's a part of it. But I think I think you just try to be smart because one of the things we wanted to try to do was you know try to run the ball and stop the run better. That, that you know that requires tackling and being physical. But I just think you got to pick your spots. You can't you can't do it. 
you know, every single day or every single period in practice. You know, maybe you pick a spot and you, and you go get, get after it for a period and you kind of pull back. But, you know, in these scrimmages, which we've had two of them already and we're going to have another one on Saturday, uh, you do got to roll, roll the ball out there and play, but you can put certain people – on a pitch count, so to speak, and then try to get them their reps and get them out of there. In terms of, of Saturday's game, you mentioned scrimmage, and that's really what it is. Uh, fo- fans are, are excited anytime they can go to a uh, an event in Oxford on a, on, a, on a Saturday, whether it's in uh, April or, or October. It's still great. But w- what is the game plan from start to finish? Uh, so what we're going to do, we're, we're going to play the offense versus the defense, and then we'll give the defense a certain amount of points, say 27 points, and then the offense is going to go try to catch them. And, uh, and that, that, that'll be, it'll be ones versus ones and twos versus twos. But, uh, you know, that, that, that way it's easy to keep up with. There's a point system and it, it's really easy to follow. Being, and you're gonna, you're gonna be asked these questions until you're not, uh, but everything is somewhat uh, of a first for you as the head coach. You've been on the staff for a long time. But, uh, what are you beginning to encounter and learn? I mean, obviously decisions come through your, your desk. I, I would think that, that's where it starts, right? Right. No, I, I just think, you know, just the, uh, I think all coaches, we're, we're all creatures of a routine. And I think that's the biggest thing for me is getting that routine. You know, as an offensive line coach for 14 years, I was doing the same thing, you know, pretty much every day. So I think getting into that routine has been critical, learning how to deal with, you know, the media, with, uh, you know, all the recruiting that you're recruiting more than one position, you're recruiting every single position. I think just getting into the routine every day, that's what's going to help me the most. You know, after the injury uh, last year, we saw Jordan Tamu and everyone uh, fell in love with him as we tend to fall in love with uh, that position. Uh, give us a report on, on Jordan and uh, how has the spring gone? Well, I, I mean, I think, uh, I think it's been great. Just like, like I said before, when he walks on the field, I mean, it's his team. So really been impressed with uh, how he's managed everything. He's kind of kind of picked up where he left off in the egg bowl when he's had a phenomenal spring L- love love his you know command of the offense and his decision making has been really really good and just uh, really excited about what he's going to do in, in terms of uh just looking ahead and and i, I know as a coach you, you you have to get through spring and then the, the, the may has an, it's all cha- it's other challenges you know going visiting and, and speaking and all the things that come with the job but do you find how do you get how do you look ahead to the season now because i know it it seems like a long way off but it really isn't no you know i think i think the biggest thing for me is just you know taking it one day at a time and trying to get better we we you know in in the spring you want to think about players not plays and that's that's we we got to get some of these young linemen that we need to provide depth some of the some of the backup receivers some young defensive linemen the you know some the linebacker group you know the the guys that really need the depth when you have an injury, I think that's where spring becomes really important and will help us come fall. You you were part of this staff a year ago when when it was awkward because of the the, the bowl situation. Uh, how do you approach twenty eighteen? Well, I, you know, I think the culture of our team is really really good. So I, I really I really enjoyed the fact to see where our team came from at the beginning of the season to the end where they were really focusing on each other and playing hard for one another because they do sacrifice an awful lot day in, day out. And so I really like that about our team, uh, not so much focusing on playing for a bowl game or this or that, but really working and, and trying to work hard for each other. And I like that about where our team has come. And, of course, for the record, uh, the school uh, is still appealing, so you really don't know for a fact. Uh, what, so, and I can understand that would be something that you'll factor in later. Yeah, no doubt. I think you always, you know, you know, you plan for the worst, and if that happens, it's a bonus. So we're going out and we're attacking, and we're trying to get better each and every day, and playing for each other. And if something like that happens, it's it's a bonus. I, I always talk to have talked to coaches uh, who have come up through the ranks like, like you have, and they they often tell me after the first season that the one thing that they they were completely unaware of was the demands on on your time, and I, I'm sure you, you're already getting. A, a sense of that. Uh, how do you manage your schedule now that that you have much more to be concerned about other than your recruiting area and coaching the line? 
Well, you know, I, I just think that, uh, I, you know, I enjoy that part of it. This is something that I've dreamed about my whole life, and so I'm, I've really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed uh, getting the chance to get out and talk to people and spread our message and, 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 you know, get a chance to build relationships with everybody on the team and just, just excited about the opportunity. And, you know, that may change later, but right now it's been a lot of fun. When you when you meet people, and, and obviously, uh, I mean, you knew a lot of people anyway. It wasn't like you were walking down to the square going unnoticed. But, <laughs> but yeah, I sense you're probably getting noticed a little more now. Yeah, that, that, that part is a little bit different. But, you know, I, I've really, you know, I really enjoy, I enjoy getting to meet people. And, you know, I, I grew up as an Ole Miss fan, and I've been a player, and I've been a coach. So I've kind of been around Ole Miss all my life. So it's fun to kind of give back. And because and, I've been one of those – People before I've been a fan, and I and I really uh, enjoy giving back and meeting those people. So you you've gone up to other head coaches, harassing them for time in the past. <laughs> Absolutely, I'd like to hear some of those stories one day. Um, I am curious though, because uh, you know you you come from that background, and, and your family is so uh, embedded in, in Ole Miss history that when when you are not sure about something, uh, where where do you go for counsel? You know, I think uh, you pull from past experiences. I think that that's number one. Um, you know, I call Coach Cutcliffe pretty regularly. You know, when I when I got the job, I called several people. But uh, I would say if I'm calling anybody for counsel, you know, I'm usually calling Coach Cutcliffe. I have my brother on staff here, which is that's helpful. When we go, you know, we'll go on an hour walk and we'll talk. It's good to have, you know, a guy on your family that's on the staff. And you can kind of bounce things off of. That's been helpful as well. Saturday is around the corner, the uh, the spring game, of course. It will be on uh, national television. Coach, always a pleasure. Thanks for making time, and we will see you very soon, I hope. Thanks, Paul. Hotty toddy. You got it. Hotty toddy from Ole Miss, and uh, we will take a break. Uh, Rebels uh, expected to continue to improve. That huge win in the Egg Bowl uh, helped uh, energize that program, and uh, Matt Luke, uh, now the head football coach at Ole Miss. We are coming back with more. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Welcome back. Glad everyone is here. Nice conversation with Coach Luke. He is uh, quite an engaging personality. You can understand how he got that job. Let's uh, continue with more phone calls at 855-2427-285. And uh, Don in Memphis, uh, go right ahead, Don. Hey, Paul. How's it going, sir? Very well. Thank you. Uh, I hate to bug you with this question, but I hadn't heard it lately. If anybody's been graphing a little bit, is there any chance of getting rid of these uh, instant under previous reviews and all that makes the game so long? Uh, I doubt it. I, I do mean, too, I mean there, there's, a, uh, there's a purpose behind it, but... Um, yeah, it's safety, one of it, I think, isn't it? Well, I mean, it's trying to get it right, but yeah, I, I, I do agree... Uh, the, uh, the the length of the game is is, is an issue, right? And the referees most time, I'd say ninety five percent right. You know, just all the time. I'm, I'm seventy one years old, been watching a long time, enjoy the show, and I really love Tennessee. Well, Don, thank you very much. You're in a good place if you love Tennessee. Uh, Jay is in a, even a better place, Knoxville. Hello, Jay. Hey, Paul. How are you doing today? We are doing well. Thanks for the call. Oh, great. Uh, listen, I believe uh, you've got on to something with South Carolina. I really do think Coach Munstaff is going to do real good over there against Georgia. But the reason I call on you, I was calling, I uh, had three quick questions earlier, and I had one for you if you would mind taking it. I'll give it a shot. Okay. Uh, uh, Nebraska, Miami, and Tennessee. In order, which school had the most players in uh, Super Bowls? Our Nebraska, Miami, or Tennessee? Yeah, hmm. they're in order. Which order? Um, we'll go Tennessee first. Miami, Nebraska. You got it. He's right on. Okay. Well, I just had to. I just. Uh, I had. To, I had to think. Peyton Manning was part of the part of the part of the answer there, but actually, I had no earthly idea. But I, I assume since you're calling from so you're calling from Knoxville, it probably was in Nebraska. Uh, that, that's the only reason I said. What's that, Mark? Yeah, I'm not sure where he got that stat from. Hey, if that's his, if that's the stat he wants to use, let him use it. Okay, but just so a fake news warning. 
the NFL.com I just looked up had the most alumni in the Super Bowl since 1970. Miami's won at 62 players. Tennessee's two at 61. Fake news. Fake news from Knoxville. Yeah, don't, don't ever believe a news outlet. Let's uh, check in next with Dwight in Tennessee. We're on a roll with the state right now. Hello, Dwight. Hey, how you doing, Paul? Great, thank you. Uh, just uh, I've had the people had some concerns about uh, uh, Pruitt bringing in Chris Winkie as the running back coach. Uh, I know uh, you know a lot of you can't coach speed, you can't coach vision, and things of that nature. But uh, uh, my thought is that. Uh, Generally, the running back gets himself in trouble when he's not running the ball, and maybe Winky can kind of bring the the running backs along in a way that uh, uh, they'll be more on the same page when they don't actually have the ball in their hand. What? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Winky was. I think he was at Alabama previously. What? What has been the concern uh, with with that hire? I haven't heard that. Well, I mean, you know, uh, uh, some of the recruits are, you know, thinking, you know, since you know Gillespie was there and. And uh, he, you know, he was a running back. Oh, I coach. see. Oh, I, I get it now. Yeah, I forgot about Gillespie leaving. You know, I, I think some of that is overdone. Uh, you know, coaches to me uh, have to make determinations on what they're comfortable with, not what the fans are comfortable with. Let's uh, check out Jim next in Georgia. Jim, go right ahead. Thank you for the call. Welcome to our show. Hey, Paul. I'm old, so bear with me a second. No, take uh, your time. I started watching Georgia football in 1957 uh, when Wallace was coach. And I uh, had, a, had a young guard named Pat Dye on the team. Had two <laughs> quarterbacks, Francis Tarkington and Charlie Britt. And they both played. And the first game I went to was Georgia-South Carolina in Athens. And uh, South Carolina had an All-America Halfback named Maddox Hawkins, and uh, I've seen a lot of Georgia games. I'm a Georgia fan, but I'm not. Uh, my life, you know, my happiness does not depend on whether the University of Georgia wins a football game. That's good. I've probably been to more, more Georgia games than uh, than most Georgia fans have, especially most of them that call your show. And I can assure you, the Alabama loss in the national championship game hurt. But it didn't hurt near as bad as that Auburn loss a week before the quick kick six over at Tuscaloosa. Oh, that was terrible. That yeah. game was played. That game hurt, you know. Uh, in the championship game, a, a young defensive back made a bad play, and an Alabama quarterback and receiver made a good play. And Georgia did not win the ball game that nobody ever expected to be in to begin with. We just, uh, you know, I, I don't even know if I'm making sense. Like I said, I got somebody to tell me. But, uh, no, uh, Jim, you know what? Uh, I happen to think older people make more sense than younger people, but that's just personal preference. Um, I, I like what you said uh, because you know, I think too many people do allow their uh, their health and well-being to be dictated and determined by what happens uh, outside of their own control. Yeah, that's... Uh Never made a lot of sense to me. I enjoy the game. Oh, sure. Know. I uh, and this may be heresy, but uh, you know I'm not that concerned with Georgia winning a national championship. You know I, I want them to run a clean Kirby to run a clean program and compete every Saturday. It's his football team to compete, and he runs a clean program. And they win as long as they don't lose to the North Avenue Trade School. I can live with. <laughs> you know, I asked a I asked a trustee once at a school that was in the process of uh, examining uh, the head coach, and I said, "Is it, is it a one loss record?" He said, "It's not so much that. It's just a matter of not embarrassing the school, and that's off and on the field. And 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 I think it's uh, off the field, self explanatory, and on the field is you know being competitive, not uh, getting blown out uh, forty. 42 to nothing. Yeah. Hey, uh, here's a, a tidbit you you probably know. You may not. I don't know, but I'll throw it out there. Did you know that Ralph Shug Jordan was once a basketball coach at the University of Georgia? You know, it's interesting, Jim. I had heard I, – I did know that, uh, only because I covered Auburn very early in my career, and I remember when uh, Coach Jordan died. Uh, but, uh, it was it, yeah, that, that, that that's always one of those uh, – fascinating uh, little tidbits. 
he was somebody asked me was he the head coach i said he was the only coach you know, <laughs> that was, he asked uh what butts had a bunch of blocking dummies and sleds and stuff stored in that junky little gym up there in athens that georgia had to play in and uh, coach jordan asked him said uh, coach butts can you get the stuff out of the gym and uh and Bud Stone said, hell, Ralph, you got a week for the first game. You know, that's how, that's how big basketball was in Athens at that time. So. Now, tell me this, because you uh, – now, Joel Eves, was, he coached um, – I'm trying to remember. He was at Auburn. He was at Auburn. Was it, wasn't there a Georgia connection, too? Yeah, he, he was uh, he was athletic director at the university. That's right. Okay. I mean, th- there were so yeah. many Auburn, Georgia. It was like uh, – Oh, yeah. yeah. It, it, it was the weirdest fast. thing in the world. If you went to Georgia, you worked at Auburn, and it was vice versa. It, it was almost insensible. Probably. Yeah, I mean, uh, and, you know, I covered Vince and, and Pat. And, you know, Di, Di played at Georgia. Vince coach uh, played at Auburn. They, and they, they, they coached the opposite school. And then the Jordan – uh, Eves and so many people that that worked at Auburn uh, went to Georgia. It was crazy. I've never seen anything quite like it. Well, Eric, Eric Russell played at Auburn, right? And coached right. At Georgia. Exactly. And there exactly. was a man that uh, man that's not one of the best coaches I've ever seen, and he's just not remembered that much. No, no. Listen, I uh, I knew him uh, vaguely when I first started my career, and uh, uh, he, he probably uh, should have been uh, the coach of Georgia, the head coach. Let me. Uh, he would have been if uh, things had, uh, you know. Anyway, that's another story. For it is. I know. I know you like the movie, so uh, that's one other thing I wanted to say. It was. Oh, you never saw Pat Die play. I'm sure. No, no, and uh, but but I, I I spent a lot of time around Coach Die, and uh, I wouldn't have he wanted. A, I wouldn't have wanted to line up opposite him. He was the best hunter, and he weighed 185 pounds. Paul, he played. He was all American at the University. Of yeah, no, he, uh, he he was around the football. I don't care. You know, he was around the football. All no, I've I've heard some. Uh, thank you, Jim, for the call. I heard plenty of stories about the Die Boys back in Georgia. You did not want to mess with that crowd. Uh, uh, we'll take a short break. Uh, we are coming back with more of your calls, more guests to come. It's been a good one so far. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. You're not worth a kill. March means one thing. Basketball, basketball, basketball. Did you know that college players born in North Dakota are historically the most accurate three-point shooters? The NCAA is using Google Cloud to turn data into insights, and so can your business. See how at g.co slash March Madness. Google Cloud, the official cloud of the NCAA. Let's grab uh, Matt next up. What do you say, Matt? Oh, I'm pissed after Friday, Paul, after you hung up the phone on me. I hung up on you, you, Matt? Yeah, you did. And i got to ask you a question. You know, I heard the show yesterday. Why do you defend Nick Saban so much? Didn't he he let you have it at Media Days last year about Cam Robinson? It was actually actually the year before. before. I mean, I challenged him on why he I mean, he he basically sat there and told you all. And I've never seen a biased show where you sit yesterday, you sit there and well, you know, you know something, you Matt. Uh, Matt, l- let me explain something before you give me a lecture. I asked him a legitimate question based in uh, my journalistic, uh, journalistic and he jumped past, all over you, and Paul. he did. I thought he made a fool out of himself, myself. But that's okay. We 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 talked afterwards. No, but you you, you thought uh, but he made you know, a but fool the, out the of the himself, difference but between the, the, how, Matt Matt the difference between you and me is that I'm a professional, and I realized that day was over. I had my say; he had his. And uh, we talked after the. He, well, he called well, me. Well, hold on a second. Hold the on. Between a you know, Matt. Kissing his butt every Matt, day, you need to learn to listen for just a second, okay? And uh, he apologized, and we saw each other a couple of days later. Where did I, he did he apologize on on air? Did well, he, he called me. The, he, he called me after the show. Well, how sweet. Well, no. I but, mean, he, but, but, but the he, point he, is, he embarrassed you in public. He didn't embarrass he me. Uh, he, I asked. I asked him a question, and he did whatever he chose to do. Yeah. Now the difference between Nick, the difference between Nick Saban and you is that Nick Saban may have embarrassed himself one time. You embarrass yourself every time. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. And we, you you talk about how you know what you know why you know why ninety nine percent of your show is like Alabama Alabama fans. I have no idea because I think the unemployment rate's the highest in Alabama than any other state. <laughs> I mean, I mean, let's be honest, Paul. 
But, I, I mean, I, I tell you what, I, I, I am officially striking the fine bomb show because you I, – I did for your ratings what Roseanne, what Trump did for Roseanne. I actually gave another opinion saying I embarrassed. No, I didn't sit there and call and say, hey, I'm the legend in, in the double-wide trailer part from Alabama. Roll tide, roll tide. You know, or uh, and and I've got two teeth, but roll tide. Or I'm some Tennessee fan. I've got one tooth, and I met this Florida girl, and go Gators. I mean, yeah, no, I actually uh, hey, the uh, most intelligent. Uh, fan by, by the way, um, by the way, uh, Alabama's unemployment rate is is below Georgia right now. <laughs> No, it's not. I just looked it up, Paul. No, well, I, I just you're looked looking, it up you're looking and, uh, at that Wikipedia again, Paul. Uh, no, I'm Come actually on, looking at uh, U.S. Uh, government statistics. So uh, try well, again. Well, let me ask you a question. If Alabama's such a great state, why did ESPN move you to Charlotte instead of keep you in the great state of Greenbow, Alabama? Uh, Alabama's unemployment rate 4.2. Georgia's is 4.6. You want to try me again? 4.7, well, I'm sorry. Ask my answer my question. Why? Why does? Why did? If Alabama was such a great state, why didn't you? First of all, I've never said there? anything about Alabama other than I lived there a long time and I happen to like it. You love it. it. You, you, uh, you, it's the I, most I would. I, would uh, I mean, l- listen. Uh, I'd move back there tomorrow if I could. I know you would. I mean, you love it. You Alabama. You. I mean, that's the sad thing about it. You're their biggest ambassador, and 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 Saban made a fool of you on media days. And you and, and you're going to sit there and say, well, Matt, you make a fool of every time you call just because <laughs> I'm a Georgia fan, you know. And here's the funny thing about it is, let's let's boil down the facts. Georgia lost by two points last year. We're not talking four touchdowns. It took the great Crimson Tide overtime to beat us in Kirby's second year. So let's face the facts. And you talk about. Let me ask you a question, Paul. How many years as a head coach did it take Nick to win a national championship? Nine, nine years. All right, we're on Kirby's, and that we're talking. We're talking about Kirby's third, third year. I remember 2007. I went down there with all those rednecks, and we beat Saban in his first year. We caught the caught the wide receiver, and we called it the touchdown. All them Tuscaloosers don't t- Tuscaloosers don't remember that. They don't remember that, Paul. But I'm about sick of you picking on Georgia and our fans, picking on Daryl. You know. If if you had a coach's ranking, it'd be Kirby. It'd be Nick Saban one through ten because you can't think of anybody else other than Alabama. You there, Paul? You still there, Matt? Yeah, I'm still here. You got a rebuttal? No, Matt, I, I'm not. I, I've chosen not to really engage you any longer because uh, you don't know how to talk to people. No, you know, I just you know don't what know you are, Matt. Matt, 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 all you are. Hey, is Paul, a, I, I, I'll tell you what. I'm going to go on strike from Paul. Feinbaum you know, Matt. State. I got to tell you, you apologize. Matt, I'm Matt, a, I'm let, a, let me I'm ask play, you. I'm gonna act like bear and play dead. Have a good day. Go dogs. You know, Matt. It, it's. I feel. I feel sorry for you. That your only only ability to find any self worth is to attack a state and to attack a fan base. Uh, you know that that's really not how we play the game here. We we try to have conversations. We try to engage each other. We don't just blabber. I mean, even Daryl uh, understands how this show is operated. Uh, and Daryl understands that if he doesn't call in, that we will all do quite well without him. Uh, I don't think you've quite gotten that memo. But quite frankly, if you never call again, somehow, some way, this show will survive. <laughs> Kelly is up next in Mississippi. Uh, how are you, Kelly? Hey, Paul, how you doing? Uh, very well, thank you. Paul, I'm from Birmingham originally, and uh, I had to move to the state of Mississippi a long time ago, and I'm still my, my, still, my blood's still crimson, you know? I understand quite well. So I'm going to ask you a question, just one question, and maybe you can help me, maybe you can't. How many total national titles between, you know, basketball and football 
between men's basketball and football is Michigan won. Since, uh, since, Michigan since, has won uh, one. Ba- they won a basketball a couple of years. Yeah, they won. They won a basketball, and they won uh, one and a half is the answer in the last fifty well, years. All right, who got who, who won the half? Uh, the football team. They they shared a championship in what year was that, Mark? Um, Ninety one or something. Uh, the University of Michigan. What their half championship? Yeah, Ninety seven. Ninety seven. I'm sorry, that was uh, Charles Woodson's year. Now they, they they did win one in basketball, didn't they? I think it was vacated though, wasn't it? Eighty nine. No, that one still stands. Well, that one that's, still the, stands. that's the one banner still hanging. Okay, I can't. Re- I couldn't remember. So they uh, Michigan in the in the last fifty years has one and a half national championship in the in the two major sports. Well, they sure get awful cocky, don't they? I mean, they may have won in uh, in lacrosse or hockey <laughs> or wrestling or. <laughs> you know, that last college just called you a minute ago. Uh, I guess it's a, a bulldog fan. You know, he uh, they don't understand. You know, because nobody nobody wins like we do. Nobody and they hate us. Why? Because you know you're you're not cocky if you can back it up, right, Paul? Uh, that's what I've always heard, yeah. Kid Rock said that. Thank Paul, you. fine, Bob. Have a great day, buddy. Yeah, g- great to hear from you. Appreciate it. Uh, let's uh, move along and uh, talk to Joe. Joe, welcome to the show. How are you? Thanks for taking my call, Paul. Uh, a while ago you were talking about Wilk Chamberlain uh, in Arkansas. I wanted to relay the story about in 1957, Arkansas and SMU tied in basketball for the championship, so they mutually agreed to play in Shreveport, Louisiana for for the championship. Really? And uh, Yes. And I, went, I was fortunate enough to get to go to that game. And Arkansas had a very large team. By that, I mean the smallest guy on the starting team was like 6'4". And uh, they, they, they uh, unfortunately drew Kansas – the first game in the NCAA tournament, they scored 52. Wilt Chamberlain scored 60. I just wanted to relay that to you. That is That's, amazing. Uh, that is truly amazing. Yep. And uh, it was uh, – and also I was uh, privileged to uh, – I met uh, Coach Bryant when uh, when he signed John David Crow and. uh from Spring Hill, Louisiana, and uh, that was in 1953. And uh, there's a story behind that, behind that signing. And uh, I don't know whether you ever knew uh, uh, Coach Sam Bailey or not. I had the pleasure of meeting him a couple of times. Okay, Sam Bailey was uh, at a small school about 20 miles away from in Arkansas from where John David Crow was from and and John David Crow was supposed to go to LSU. He went to LSU and he didn't like the way he was treated. He came back home and said, I'm not going there. I'm not going. I don't like it. And so he went to this small school and Sam Bailey was a coach there and uh, they said, man, you're too good to be going here. You you don't have any, you got to so the head coach knew Coach Bryant, and Coach Bryant had just been, I think, one year at A and M. He called Coach Bryant, and he came and and signed him. That's how John David Crow wound up at Texas A and M, and the only Heisman Trophy winner that Coach Bryant ever coached. That is uh, that is truly amazing, and I, I, I had the, the opportunity to talk to him a couple of times, uh, John David, and uh, what a class act too. Yeah, he was he was uh, he was uh, uh, the best high school player I ever saw in my life. And, wow! Uh, he he did, they would not let him practice with the, against the first team defense because he hurt people. <laughs> he ran over people. He didn't run around them. He ran over. That is amazing. He was a big guy for that 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 time and a period of time. You didn't have the big lineman like you have now, and. Uh, it was it was unreal to watch him play. Yeah, he was just way ahead of his time back in those days. 
But thanks for taking my Thank call. Thank you very much. What a pleasure, Joe. Uh, we've had some great callers today, and uh, we will continue at 855, well, minus Sam's uh, Matt. Uh, 855-242-7285. We are coming right back. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Mark in Richmond, Virginia. Hello, Mark. Hey, Paul. I'm, I'm an over-the-road truck driver. I'm on my way to Richmond, but I'm a big Georgia Bulldog fan. How you doing? Wonderful. Great. Glad to hear from you. Well, what got, him, what got me to call you for the first time is uh, that Matt guy. Good night. I mean... How can you be so obnoxious about the team you like and be – he was really disrespectful to you. And, uh, well, that's okay. Listen, I, you know, I don't mind uh, what people say to me. Uh, I'm I'm supposed to be uh, a punching bag here, but it, it's just – what I object to is the fact that you cannot talk to him. I mean, he just knows everything and doesn't stop. Uh, I mean, everyone everyone has a right to talk, but uh, at yeah, some sure. point, man. But he was – he kind of sounded – I don't even know if he's worthy to be a doormat at the University of Georgia. <laughs> Good night, but anyway, I love Georgia, and I think they got a great team. And uh, but I don't think we're quite there yet. But you know, you got to be, you got to beat the big guy. That's 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 Alabama. Well, I want to say I want to say something to you, Mark, before you go. Uh, being an over the over the over the road uh, truck driver. Um, when, we, when this program went to Sirius XM back in uh, 2010, you guys were uh, the, the heart and soul of, of our expansion, uh, and uh, I really appreciate uh, the truckers out there for helping uh, make this show uh, what it is on a national basis. Oh, no problem. I enjoy it. Really you bet. enjoy great, it. Great to hear from you. Thanks so much. Uh, I man is up next. Uh, he is an indoor... Air comfort engineer, Paul. <laughs> An indoor air comfort engineer. Thank you, I man. Uh, that means I know more about it than you do, and that's why you would call me. And I did try to call you once, about. and you wouldn't call me back. Well, that's because you said, do you know who I am? I'm Paul Feinbaum. You must not know who I am, and well, I know who you that's are. That's usually how I start conversations. And, 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 and you know what? I knew when I got through, you wasn't going to pay me. Because I still have yet to get that Zippo lighter. I mean, what's a Zippo lighter? Twenty-two, three bucks. Take a nail scratch, I man. You. I mean, I, I, ju- I just sent you one. Uh, do, you, do you get it? Uh, do you get Air Amazon Prime? If it, if if you send it on Amazon Prime, then I would assume that it would be primely delivered to my door. Yeah, I just I just ordered you a Zippo. Okay, all right. You know, since we're we're going back way back in the way back machine, you know what? In fourteen ninety two, Columbus set out COD, with three I ships. Ordered you, uh... Three ships, and they and you know they they thought he was going to go off the edge of the world. In four hundred and six years, Auburn beat the living hell out of University of Alabama in Birmingham. In four hundred and six years, it took that long to sail off the edge of the world that was round, not flat, and to end up in Birmingham. And now the Georgia fans are scared of success. They, they they're crying amongst themselves. They fe- I think Georgia fans fear success more than anything. They, they're grabbing so hard, and they think because they got Kirby and he knows how Alabama cheats so well that that he's going to bring that to them. But they are scared of success, and they're also scared of losing. Because now they're in that, that middle zone, and they see Florida and Tennessee fixing to come on like gangbusters, like Al Capone and Lucky Luciano and all them cats. Don't Whoever you make, don't you make you fun know, of Al guys Capone? What's that? All Al Capone did was uh, forget to pay his taxes. That's all, but it what did it cost him? Well, I mean, my goodness, sex lies. I mean, Alcatraz and, and some of these other God for hey, Let me places. tell you something. I've been to Alcatraz. It's, the view is incredible. And, and you know what? It certainly doesn't look like a place you'd want to stay too. No, long, that was the only like thing about it. I, mean, I, I really enjoyed going, but it was it was more fun to leave. That, absolutely, and I didn't and have to swim to shore. One cats thought that left there too. And and you, but you know, right now I do believe that Georgia is scared of success because with that they've got to maintain if they want to be a big boy in the conversation, and it's not easy in the SEC. And you know, back. We could go 20 years ago. The SEC had the greatest coaches. of. It's, it's amazing the coaches that have gone through this league. Some of them not so good, but the others were just 
just prime. And and it never goes without saying the SEC has an amazing group of coaches as they do this year. But Georgia is uh, they're, they're scared of success, Paul. You can hear it. They're, they're, they're scared. They're trembling. And they got to call you up and blame you because you're not on the Georgia bandwagon. But Georgia hasn't done enough really to show anybody, have they? Missouri this would normally be where I interrupt the caller, but people are cheering and asking me to. So we'll be right back. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Put a little cherry on the top. March means one thing. Basketball, basketball, basketball. Did you know that college players born in North Dakota are historically the most accurate three-point shooters? The NCAA is using Google Cloud to turn data into insights, and so can your business. See how at g.co slash March Madness. Google Cloud, the official cloud of the NCAA. It was BYOG, bring your own guts. This is the best, the best Do you hear me? of the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Glad you are with us. Second half of the show. Matt and Luke joined us earlier. We uh, certainly appreciate the uh, Ole Miss coach uh, taking some time out. Let's uh, continue with more phone calls. And Rich in the ATL. What's up, Rich? What's up, Jack? How you doing, bro? We are doing great. Thank you. Jack, what's the chances Matt from Gainesville shows up at SEC Media Days? I think they're pretty good. I do, too. You know, that's right down to 85. Hey, um, forget him. He's a moron. Hey, um, have you been paying attention to um, what's going on at Augusta with uh, Tiger Woods the last couple of days? Yeah, sure. Isn't it crazy? I mean, seriously, Couples was talking about him last night. I saw him on the Golf Channel. And, then uh, you know, he played with Nicholson today, right? In the yeah, uh, he played uh, with uh, Phil and uh, Fred played with him as well. Fred's kind of uh, the yeah. uh, the official uh, host of the Masters now. Isn't it cool, though, that he played with Mickelson? Could you imagine him playing a practice round with Phil 20 years ago? No. Uh, you, you know, I think uh, you know, maybe uh, being away from a Tiger maybe is now seeing his position with Phil as Arnie and Jack of 30 or 40 years ago. That's kind of what I'm getting at. And here's my question for you. If, if he had to do it over again, if you were him, minus all the personal stuff, because that's really nobody's business, in my opinion, what do you think he would have did differently? You know, there's a, there's a catch at the end of that question. Um, and and I, I think Tiger has great regret of all the people uh, that he has hurt, but – for, as an, from an analyst standpoint, Rich, I think to do what he to accomplish what he did, he probably would have had to gone down the same path. Seriously, see, I don't. I see. That's why I disagree. That's well, okay. I think if I think if um, if he had to do it over again, I think the arrogance and, and uh, well, I think he would have dropped the arrogance because well, let me what ask you this: if, if you would, yes. t- I mean, would Tiger give up those four? T- Here's where it gets hard. Uh, I mean, it's, it's always like you know, you sit around, and you look down. Okay, what would you do to change your life? Um, right. I mean, I think I, I think he had to be that way to win the fourteen. Uh, majors. I, I don't think he had to be that way to be as rude and arrogant to everyone that came in front of him, including his wife and 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 and, fr- and friends. But you know this, Rich, and I'm not making excuses for anyone. But uh, those people, those rare people like that, uh, do you do you know many really good guys in that club? Absolutely not. Other than other than you, Jack. Well, I'm not but in that club, uh, but 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 <laughs> I, but I, I, I would tell you, uh, and I'll, I'll use Nick Saban as an example. I think Nick Saban at 66 is a much nicer person than he was at 56 because he right. realizes that he has missed a lot in his life, and I think that's why he has stayed at Alabama, and I think that's why he is spend, spending as much time now with uh, his kids and his grandkids, and I'll I'll leave it at that. No, I, I I totally understand what you're saying, but I'm talking. But what I was getting at that marketing machine that he became. I, I, I Ben, he's accountable ultimately for his behavior. Oh sure. However, do, do you think exactly? 
Do you think Nike and IMG and, and the, uh, do you really think that they helped him in hindsight? No, they I didn't. I mean, they uh, helped him become a billionaire, no, because, but uh, uh, again. They all cared about the same thing, Rich, and, and they all got what they did. Money. Yeah, and, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to claim I know Tiger Woods. I, I, I've been around him a couple of times uh, in, in fairly intimate settings. I've watched him and others. And I just think he, he didn't see anything uh, peripherally or, or, or in front of him other than, uh, than the golf course. And, no, I, I understand. Yeah, and, and, but and don't I, you think I, I know people he... like that. No, no one like him, of course. Uh, now, I don't know Michael Jordan, but uh, I've watched Michael Jordan up close. And in his prime, he wasn't a whole lot different. Right. But don't you think that another thing tangibly would have been his playing schedule? I mean, he's only a couple behind, I think, Byron Nelson. I'm not sure who's the all-time leader on the PGA Tour. He's only a couple behind him. And and he only played X amount of events during the year. And I think that's another regret he would have was maybe he should have played more often. Do you think that's fair enough? I think that's fair. But, but you know, listen, I, I, I watched a lot of Nicholas in his prime. Uh, not his prime, but his later prime. And you know, he didn't play many tournaments either. Oh, I didn't realize that. Now, now, early on he did because there weren't that many tournaments. But I, I'm talking about as Nicholas uh, got into his 30s and 40s, uh, he was pretty particular. Uh, and, right. and again, again the, other, the other thing about Nicholas, uh, you know, Nicholas uh, starting 35, 40 years ago, started designing golf courses all over the world. So that took him out of the, um, you know, it, it, once he hit 40, I mean, that's really what he was doing. Right. No, I get it. I get it. And Jack never had any of the arrogance uh, Woods he had, though. Well, but that was the but, other you know, thing. But, I mean, but you let can't. me say this about Jack. And, and, I, and of, of the people we've talked about, I've been around him the most. Uh, he is not the most. He was not the most engaging guy. Uh, he still, you know, he still isn't. I mean, he's an old guy now. Uh, but uh, you know, Palmer had the charm. Jack really never had that much charm. He just, uh, he was just a great player. Yeah, yeah, and he was the greatest ever. All right, Jack. Well, thanks. I'm looking forward to it. Who do you who do you like this weekend? I'm, Too early I'm, prediction. I'm, I'm going JT all the way. Justin Thomas. I like Dustin. I I think Dustin's going to win. But uh, JT said. Well, you know, du- Dustin played with. Um, he played with Trump the other day. I hope Trump didn't screw up his game. <laughs> I didn't realize that. I thought he was playing with <laughs> Jim from Tuscaloosa. Well, no, that was, well, that was that was, that, was uh, that was a threesome. It was it was uh, they played it, they played at tr- Trump International. It was Jim and J- Jim won, by the way. Yeah, I'm sure he did. Giving Trump guess, and he Jim gave Trump six aside, and he gave Dustin one aside. <laughs> I'm sure he did. All right, bro. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Uh, let's continue. Uh, Harley is in Georgia. Harley, what do you say? Hey, what's going on, Mr. Feinbaum? We are doing well. Thank you. I happen to live in uh, Gainesville, Georgia. Oh, my. Poor thing. I am a transplant from a small town in uh, on the river uh, next to Columbus, Georgia, where Daryl's from, called Phoenix City. Been a lifelong Alabama fan. Try to be a realist. My brother's a season ticket holder at Auburn, and I've got my daughter is a diehard Georgia fan. And I'm coming at this at all different directions, and I know. But the thing that gets me with Alabama fans and Auburn fans is that they can agree to disagree and dislike one another, but. Georgia fans have a problem accepting the fact that they can't beat Alabama. <laughs> it's an SEC championship, a national championship, and and I can't remember the year uh, when uh, I think it was Aaron Murray was the quarterback. Georgia comes down, they're coming back. Alabama had played probably the worst ball game they played all year against a good team. Georgia throws a little flare pass to the left. They come right back to the same play. The ball is tipped, and they're six yards short. Well, this past year, in the national championship, that ball game should have never even went into overtime. We got duck hook field goal kickers. We got, uh, and I hate to say it, hurts me. Missing two wide open receivers for touchdowns. 
And I guess the point I'm trying to make is that, and I know Auburn beat Alabama, and I know that Auburn beat Georgia. But I try to look at everything in a realistic view, I guess, because I'm a 65-year-old guy. But it's – give me your take on that and why somebody – and this, and then I'll hush and let you talk. Georgia, UGA is the only school I know who has a song that talks about how obnoxious they are. (laughs) And you know the song I'm talking about, right? Have you heard the song? I always thought the Georgia theme song was was Black Dog. No, that, that was a song... And I saw it and uh, and heard it several years ago when it was Uga uh, one two three four five. I can't remember. However, the fact was we're from Georgia. I'll not I'll not try to embarrass myself and sing. And that yes, yeah. we're obnoxious because we should be. And that's paraphrasing, but uh, why would anybody want to call and constantly? harass you or a fan base from any school that their school has all the shortcomings, if you know what I mean. Well, first of all, I'm not going to judge a fan base uh, by, by, by some song, okay? Okay, I got you for there, Charles. Okay, go ahead. You know, I, I'm going to uh, d- disagree with you, Harley. I mean, I, I have a lot of friends who are Georgia fans. And I, you could almost make this statement about any fan base, but, I mean, they're always the outliers. Um, I mean, I feel like I am a moderately astute student of fan bases in the SEC. I've uh, covered this league for a long time. I wrote a book uh, a couple of years ago about the culture of the SEC, and I would not rank Georgia fans among the the very worst. I I think by and large, I used to criticize Georgia fans in, uh, under Rick for being too passive. Uh, they would call up and say, "Yeah, well, we won eight or nine games." Or Rick's a good man. I mean, that finally ran out. Uh, it's a different culture now. I think Kirby's a totally different coach. But 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 this is not uh, a program that uh, lives in the past or or, you know, thinks it's invincible. I mean, I think Georgia fans are pretty realistic about who they are. Uh, they're pretty confident right now, though, and, and, and they should be confident because they have a great coach, and this program is, is, is pretty much all the way back. We'll take a break. More of your calls when we come back. We'll talk a little bit about the Razorbacks. Are they coming back? They need to, but will they? We'll find out in a minute. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Glad you're back with us here on a Tuesday afternoon. It's been a while since we have uh, spoken to Jason Kersey. Uh, he covers the Arkansas Razorbacks, and uh, what a good opportunity to find out what's happening with a new coach. Jason, uh, it's been a long time. I hope uh, all is well with you, and uh, set the scene for us. How's everything going with uh, Chad Morris? Yeah, well, Paul, first of all, thanks for having me on. It's nice to talk to you again. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of excitement uh, around here about Chad Morris. You know, the the fan base had had really sort of turned on on Brett Bielema there at the end, and for obvious reasons, I mean, uh, things weren't going well. They were a bad, bad football team last year, um, and Chad Morris has definitely provided some uh, some excitement. I think that his offense, uh, his style of offense, is what these fans have have really wanted to see for for quite some time, and I think they got a little taste of it with Bobby Petrino and. We all know how that ended, so I think uh, now Chad Morris promises to bring an exciting offense back to back to Fayetteville, and uh, it, and and then uh, you know on the defensive side, I think uh, you know John Chavis for you know whatever you want to say about the few years he had at Texas A and M, this is a top notch defensive coordinator, and I think uh, you know I think there's a chance that that there's reason to be excited, maybe not this year uh, because I think Brett Bielema's staff left the talent level a little bit low, but. Um, you know, down the road, I definitely think there's a there's a there's a, some signs of hope for Arkansas here. Yeah, Jay, let me talk about uh, Chavis for a minute because uh, you know when he was at Tennessee, uh, we all know the respect he had. That move to 
LSU. When he went to A&M, the expectations were high. And then we kind of forgot about him because the uh, defenses were not that great, even though he had the best player in the country uh, two years ago. Why should, and this obviously a, it's, it's an interpretive question, why should Arkansas fans believe this trip will be different for John Chavis? Yeah, and that's a very fair question. I, I think um, in the case of uh, when he was at Texas A&M, I think, uh, you know, I think there were a lot of factors there. But, but one thing that is important to remember is that the numbers did get better for him at Texas A&M than they were previously. I mean, uh, he did make some improvements. He had NFL uh, guys who made it into the NFL. So I, mean, I think um, obviously it wasn't what anyone expected, and that's, and that's fair. But I think – I think he did make improvement. I think he still knows how to coach people. And I think once he gets his system in here, I think there's there's definitely reason to, to believe. Now, the biggest problem John Chavis is going to face this year and maybe for the next couple of years is the just incredible lack of talent. I mean, uh, you know, Brett Bielema's staff did not recruit well, especially on the defensive side of the ball. They have maybe two or three people, I think, that are definite SEC football players, Ryan Pauley, McKelvin, a game, and, and then probably linebacker Dijon Harris. And outside of that, um, they're, they're not working with much. So, uh, so this year, I think, I think Arkansas fans are going to need to be patient with Chavis because um, this, this is not a talented football team right now. Let me back up for just a second, Jason, because you know, so many of us, us in the media, you know, kept saying, well, Brett Bielema is a really good coach. How did it get so bad under Bielema? Yeah, uh, it, it's it's incredible how how quickly it turned. I mean, we're you know he he had improved that team uh, from you know from uh, three and nine to seven and six to eight and five, and it felt like things were definitely moving in the right direction. They won two bowl games, and then you know I think the end of the 2016 season when they blew huge uh, second half leads to Missouri and Virginia Tech, that's when things started to turn. Um, but that's not the only reason that things went bad last season. I think the lack of talent, I, I keep coming back to that, but I think the lack of talent really hurt. And uh, one thing Brett Bielema did, and, and I don't know why this happened, but they just did not recruit Texas. I mean, I think in his five classes he signed 15 people from Texas. Well, that's a border state with, that is just overflowing with Division One talent, and it's just mind-boggling that he didn't recruit Texas better. Uh, and I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I think one big one um, – you know, there were the reports that, that he, uh, you know, he, the, the fight that he got in with Cliff Kingsbury over, uh, you know, how, how he wanted to play offense. I, I think that bothered a lot of coaches in Texas. And, and, uh, it, but, but Texas is a border state. Arkansas can only be good if they recruit Texas well. If they recruit Texas the same way that Oklahoma State and Oklahoma do, and they just didn't do that. Now, the good thing for Chad Morris is he was a, he was a Texas high school coach. Uh, two or three of his other staff members were Texas high school coaches. It may take some time, but I think they're going to get back into Texas. And, and uh, if they can do that, then they can turn things around. It just may take a little time. We, we know what Chad Morris has done as an assistant and obviously as a head coach, but uh, if you had to take a, uh, not a wild guess, because you probably have a pretty good idea, but what is this offense going to look like? Well, I mean, I think they're going to play fast, obviously. They're, they're, and that's going to be a big change from what we saw under Brett Bielema. They <laughs> just did not play fast. They huddled up. That's just something that, uh, that Chad Morris does not do. And, and um, you know, right now the, the big question for me is, is is the offensive line. That got really bad the last two years under Brett Bielema. Um, it'll be interesting to see what they're able to do there. But, you know, they have some talent on offense. Cole Kelly is probably going to be the quarterback. I think he's a talented guy. Um, I think he's definitely capable of playing in this kind of system. And then at running back, Devwall Whaley and T.J. Hammonds and Chase Hayden are all three really talented running backs. And, and running backs can ca- and, and they're running backs that can catch the ball. They're running backs that can do a lot of different things. So um, I, I think that really a lot of it's going to depend on what the offensive line does and who steps up at receiver. But um, Arkansas fans are not going to recognize this offense because it looks, it's going to look nothing like what it looked like last year. Jason, uh, looking at the personnel and, and looking at uh, the schedule, this is, these are always questions people love in early April. Right. What's the range for the Razorbacks? Oh, gosh. I, you know, it'd be great if they could get bull eligible. I think that might be um, a little bit tough, although uh, I think the non-conference slate is a little bit maybe easier than it was last year. They don't have, to, they don't have a TCU uh, on the schedule, but they do have to 
Uh, and they, you know they're they're not going to beat Alabama. They're probably not. They're not going to beat Auburn. They're, you know, this is a team that needs to try to get to six wins. If they can get to six wins, I think it's a successful season. But um, I'm, I'm just not sure that they're quite there. Based on how bad they were last year, I mean, people forget last year they are two comeback wins against Ole Miss and Coastal Carolina, which they won by one point from going 2-10 and ten last season. Mm. So this is, this is a team that has a lot of rebuilding to do. <sighs> Bowl eligible, that's not exactly what Razorback fans think thought they would be talking about uh, looking back maybe four years ago in 2018. By now, I think, Jason, and you would agree, they, they, were, they were at least hoping to be in the conversation. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, they went from uh, having, you know, a Bobby, Bobby Petrino's last two years, they won 10 games. They, were, uh, they went to the Sugar Bowl one year. They, they won the Cotton Bowl, Bobby Petrino's last year. They finished ranked fifth in the country, only losses to LSU and Alabama. There was a reason to believe that that uh, you know Arkansas was a program that might be right there on the cusp of being a national power, and uh, and things just fell apart after that, and they haven't figured out how to put it back together. Good to catch up, Jason Kersey, uh, joining us. He's uh, with the Athletic. Uh, it's a great new uh, publication, and uh, we hope to talk to you very soon, Jason. Be well. All right, Paul. Thank you. See you. Good, good stuff. Uh, we are up against a break here, and uh, more of your phone calls. Matt Luke was with us earlier. Your phone call is next at 855-242-7285. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. You're not worth a clip. March means one thing. Basketball, basketball, basketball. Did you know that college players born in North Dakota are historically the most accurate three-point shooters? The NCAA is using Google Cloud to turn data into insights, and so can your business. See how at g.co slash March Madness. Google Cloud, the official cloud of the NCAA. Glad you're here. Let's get to the calls at 855-242-7285. Sam is in Athens. Hey, Sam, go right ahead. Let's go eat. Got to answer the phone when we go to you. Martin is up next. Martin, go right ahead. Martin, welcome to the show. Hey, Paul. I wanted to tell you a story in regard to the fella from Georgia that called earlier. Okay. Uh, My brother and I, me being an Alabama fan and my brother being a big Auburn fan, back in the 60s, during halftime at the Alabama-Auburn games, we would go out in the front yard and... We would wrestle in the front yard, and uh, one year we rode across a red ant bed. Then we fought each other to see who could get in the bathtub first to get the red <laughs> ants off of us as we were being eaten alive. You don't want red ants. And uh, today, when we walk off his front porch after an Alabama-Auburn game, he'll have his Auburn hat on, and he'll look at me and wink, and he'll say, Roll Tide. And me with my Alabama hat, I'll wink back and I'll say War Eagle. And that wink goes back to the days of rolling across that ant bed. And uh, one thing about Alabama and Auburn, we have a rivalry that's second to none. We have some of the best-looking southern bells that ever walked the face of the earth. We have some of the best soul food you ever put in your mouth. And we have the Paul Feinbaum show. (laughs) Well, uh, thanks, Martin. Uh, You're in Sterrett, Alabama, right? Right. Used to live just right up the road from you, so uh, I know where it is. (laughs) Well, anytime you get ready to come home, Paul, we'll leave the light on for you, okay? Well, make make sure you got a new bulb, okay? (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, it's like somebody said, tell tell those folks over there in Georgia – that when the girls go to pull out that bag of potatoes out from under the counter to keep their knees together because potatoes have eyes. And when that guy calls you back, Paul, shoot low because they're riding Shetland ponies. (laughs) I remember that one well. (laughs) Thank you, Martin. See you. What a pleasure. Thank you very much. Great to hear from you. John in St. Louis. Hello, John. Paul, how are you today? We're doing great. Thank you. Good. I'm a uh, you know big Missouri uh, Tiger basketball fan, and uh, uh, being from the uh, state of Missouri and grew up in Kansas City, but uh, really uh, been following the Tigers since the 
early early 1970s. But what I want to talk about is uh, basically Arkansas basketball fans have uh, you know they've been jumping all over Mike Anderson here lately. He had a caller last week that was not very happy with uh, the Razorbacks' performance in the NC2A tournament. Well, uh, let's be honest, it wasn't very good. Um, so, uh, well, it, what, the reason I called, though, is that uh, I wanted to uh, put in my two cents for Coach Mike because, you know, I, I have a really high regard for him because, you know, he inherited a program in Columbia, Missouri that, uh, you know, was just a total disaster with Quinn Snyder back oh, yeah. in 2006. Oh, yeah. And Coach Mike went out, and he didn't recruit – four or five star guys but he went out and picked up you know three star recruits that you know kind of nobody else wanted kind of players players like tj tiller and damari carroll and so on and so forth and he, he blended those kids together as a team to play his style of ball which by the way is really tough to play and you know he took him to he took connecticut to the last two minutes to get into the final four back in 20 2009 so I mean, he, he he's a coach who demands a lot and gets a lot out of his kids, and I just wanted to tell Arkansas fans, be patient here. He's the kind of a coach who can get to that Final Four. Yeah, you know, I think he can. And, and again, they lost to a really good team this year. But um, I, I think overall, Mike is, is, a, is an outstanding coach. And last year they were a bad call away from uh, beating North Carolina. And, you know, this year they had, they had some runs. Uh, uh, they just kind of ran out of gas in the champion in, in the NCAA tournament. But anyway, Paul, you have a great show, and I enjoy uh, listening to uh, listening to you. You're, you know, the thing I like about you, Paul, you're very, very level-headed. You never get too excited with the callers. <laughs> that's that's a plus. Well, uh, you know, John, I am uh, I am not a television uh, performer. Uh, I, 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 I came from the newspapers and the radio, so I'll leave the the theatrics to others down the dial. Very good. Paul, have a good one, okay? Thank you very much. Great to hear from you. Um, Combo is up next. Hello, Combo. Combo, you there? Combo out. Don in Asheville, North Carolina. Hello, Don. Go right ahead. Hey, Paul. How are you doing? Quite well. Thank you very much for the call. Don't know if anybody has ever asked you this about the blue blood basketball programs. Why can they not have football programs like my Tar Heels in Kentucky? Well, I mean, if you go back in in history, which I know you probably can easily do, uh, the Tar Heels were really on a roll under Mac Brown. Remember those days? Right. Uh, yeah. They were winning nine, ten games a year, and then the program was kind of. Go- I-, I thought Fedora was going to elevate this program to a very high level, and he did it for about two years. I don't know why he couldn't sustain it, though. Well, they they lost like 18 players to yeah. injury this year, so we're hoping for better things next year. Um, just uh, never heard anybody talk about the difference between yeah, blue blood basketball. Yeah, I've looked into it. I mean, uh, you know, Duke had a run under Cutcliffe. Uh, it's, uh, I think sometimes it's emphasis. And, right. you know, I mean, I, I don't think North Carolina should should be average in anything. I mean, that's one of the great exactly. uh, academic institutions around public academic institutions. Uh, but I can't explain that. But it's, it's really, uh, you know, like Alabama, just the, the, the other side of the North Carolina basketball, I think would be Alabama football. And, you know, they've, they've tried to elevate basketball. They're talking about a new arena. So I, I think sometimes it really comes from within and you know, I think Bubba Cunningham uh, probably you know has a high standard for football, but uh, you know, it just seems like this program the last two years has been uh, has been uh, snake. But hey, thank you very much for the call, Don. I do appreciate it. Let's go to Ian in Orlando. Uh, Ian, go right ahead. Hello, Paul. Hello, Ian. Cheers. Good evening. Cheers. Good afternoon. Um, I'm hoping you can give me a bit of advice here. I'm on holiday down here for the first time. Apparently, you can tell by my accent. I'm a little nervous here. My daughter and I are here. She prolonged her holiday, college tour, you know, spring break. Her name is Amber, and her boyfriend, Zaslo, are so slim from what I fear is a drug 
that they must be on. The street name is called 790, 790. Our good Dr. Romberg said it is a big oh, Hold on a second. Let me, uh, 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 Ian, uh, allow me to interrupt. If, of course. If, absolutely. You're, you're, where, where in, uh, where in yes. England are you from? Worcestershire. Worcestershire. I put that on my stage Worcestershire, last UK. The kids call it the Hobbit, but it's the street name is also 790. They call it the Tobin, too. We're hoping, I'm hoping, that you could actually help me and my daughter, Amber, take uh, the Hobbit. No, that, that's, that's Amber, not Amber. Amber. Her Amber. name is Amber. Like the, Amber Wilson, like my daughter. Amber my Amber last name is yes, Wilson, yes. too. Obviously, and you're in uh, yes. you're in Orlando. Why? Celebrating spring break with her. She uh, prolonged, I said, her extension. So I'm here so, trying uh, to make uh, sure. Uh, is it spring in she listens Worcester? to you all the time? I'm sorry. Is it? Is it? Do you have spring break over in uh, Worcester? Worcestershire. Worcestershire. <laughs> I told you, I prefer a word. Not to be mistaken with the sauce. So you know, it's the same thing. There, <laughs> so, okay, you know. hold on. Let's stop. Uh, because yes. my, my grandfather's from London, so I should get this right. It's of course. It's not. It's it's not Worcester. It's Worcester. It's Worcestershire. Worcestershire. We're from Worcestershire, Worcestershire, UK, England. UK. My daughter Amber, her boyfriend Zaslo. Zaslo. What? I been, mean, if it. Uh, you know, if, if if your daughter out there comes home, Carry and, on. And, and her and and you know, her name is Amber, and you, and she says, "Dad, I want you to meet Zazlo." I thought he was I mean, Russian you think you're, to begin with. But I mean, for, no, he's a cherry, you think mate. you're like in a Dickens book or something, don't you? I sometimes I feel like I am. They were the, in I mean, such I don't know about you, novel. but the, they were the best of times and the worst of times. No, we we. The best of times and the best of times. You got to think positive, you know. <laughs> My fingers are getting blisters. I'm, on. A stu- I'm a student of English lit. I can't <laughs> think positive. Cheers. We love you, you know. Thanks no, for the advice, though. Oh, uh, please give Amber my best, and thank good. And she was right to. And that drug seven ninety. Seven ninety. Absolutely, everyone knows seven ninety. Yes, of course. Absolutely. Shalom. <laughs> you guys were so kind to Israel, I thought I'd throw that out. Uh, we'll take a short break. 855-242-7285. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Glad you're with us. Uh, squirrel, it's been a while since we've talked to the Squirrel. Uh, it's been a couple of days. Man, you had an outstanding show today. You, you are Thank taking you. no prisoners today. And you started at the very beginning with that way. I mean, you dismissed... Jimbo Fisher's hunting buddy, and uh, you die. And you, you have to admit, up. I mean, you are you are a little tired of hearing about the hunting lodge, aren't you? Let me tell you something. I I'm a hunter, and I've been in, I've been around some of those type places. People that do that, that that cat was lying from the very beginning, Paul. You knew that. I mean, people of that nature who do things of that nature don't go go on radio and sound like a drunken sailor and brag about it. Yeah, he said I mean, that he and Jimbo were best buddies, and he oh, and uh, that he was moving, to, he was following Jimbo. Jimbo's been there for about four months. Well, let me tell you something. Jimbo is a football coach, and, and uh, unfortunately, deer season and football season kind of coincide. They do. And I don't think Jimbo's going to be doing a whole lot of deer hunting, but if he did want a deer hunt, I'm sure as the coach at Texas A&M, he's probably got access yeah. to some you of think, the most prime uh, hunting properties. And, and Squirrel, I'm not an expert on uh, hunting, but I do I do know Texas is pretty rich in hunting. Oh, Texas has got a, a great hunting culture. And, uh, and, and thank God for Texas, I guess is all you can say on that. But no, I mean, you, you're serious. You, you usually give callers a, a few seconds to come to the air when you go to them. But today, if they don't answer the bell, boom, next caller. And I like that. And, and I'll get on straight to business, too. Um, Friday, your lap dog called in. He was a little bit upset with you. Well, first of all, let me ask you another question. Though. How many tweaks do you get per day? Um, I, I don't know the number, but I, I would say it's it's quite high. Yeah, a thousand or more? Yeah. Yeah. And I don't expect you to answer them, but I sent you a tweet Friday. After I hung up, you said, once again, another gym call from Squirrel. And I sent you a tweet, and I just simply asked you the question, Paul, 
every one of Jim's calls are about Jim. Why can't one of my calls be about Jim? <laughs> so, I mean, that was a, that was a valid uh, You know, Squirrel, I'm sorry I didn't answer your tweet, but the, the, as soon as we disagreed, I blocked you on Twitter, so that's why I didn't oh, see that's it. that's okay. I mean, I've been blocked before, and I'll be blocked again. But, you know, occasionally I do try to have a sports take. I mean, I tried to call in a week or two ago and talk to you about Randy Sanders up there at my old alma mater, and uh, now he's done gotten the news uh, <laughs> up there at Eastern State. State. But, but, no, seriously, Jim, um, after he left your show, he went on the Legends show. And, and oh, really? And picked up the argument from there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Somebody alerted me to it over the weekend, and I went to the podcast. Didn't realize and, and Jim was Legend on Legends show. 30, Legend only has 30 minutes in his infomercial, and they spent 15 minutes talking about me and I, man. So I don't understand that. But what trouble? Well, man, by the way, Jim do you guys are, were, did you guys pick the seventh race or what? Well, once again, I'm not interested in the drink specials at the Birmingham Dog Track. I mean, <laughs> people in that area, great. I mean, I'm all for it. Go there. I'm sure that bar is lively. I won the it's Daily Double today, today, by the way. Well, good, good. I, I'm more of a – I box them. I'm, I'm a boxing type yeah. guy. I'll pick some dogs and box them all the way around, and, and hopefully one of them may hit. But but he called in. He, he advocated violence against me, Paul. He, um, he, he, he no no. That, uh, Squirrel, there's no way Jim advocated violence against a he, fellow well, man. For one reason, he didn't want to be violent himself. He suggested that Legend get me in an empty room, and uh, I don't know about. So that. he's encouraging I mean, Legend to do violence to against get me you in an empty room. That's what he said. Well, he's I don't got like Legend. This. I don't know. I, mean, I know he's had some brushes with the law. Minor, he's minor still on probation, but you. The last thing Legend needs to do is get another off pitch. Well, well, no, I think, I think Legend, uh, first of all, I think Legend has paid his debt to society. Well, of course he has. Yeah. I mean, he's walking around, so he, 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 there's not a wanted poster out after him, so yeah, he pays No, his no, debt I mean, he, listen, I mean, I think if you go to jail and you come out and are rehabilitated, and the, and the first sign of being rehabilitated, in my mind, is that you become a fine bomb caller. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, again, I'm still waiting for my first night in jail. But it could be down the road. Uh, have you ever been to jail, Paul? No. You never spent the night there? No, no I've, I've never spent episode? the night in jail. I've been to many jails, uh, seeing a lot of my friends. But uh, yeah, I bet you have. <laughs> Ironically, a lot of your friends are jailbirds. I don't, I don't yeah, I've been, to, I've, been, I've been to some serious jails in my time. I bet you have. Well, but look, I've, I have never been, uh, dog, but I've never spent the night there. The, the next time your lap dog calls in, tell him to handle his own business and don't be trying to Pedal his business off on legend. Aloha. Okay, man. That's, that sounds like a threat. That did. We have an hour to go to settle all debts. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Put a little carry on the top. March means one thing basketball, basketball, basketball. Did you know that college players born in North Dakota are historically the most accurate three-point shooters? The NCAA is using Google Cloud to turn data into insights, and so can your business. See how at g.co slash March Madness. Google Cloud, the official cloud of the NCAA. It was Big Y-O-G, bring your own guts. This is the best, the best Do you hear me? of the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Final hour has arrived. No cheering, please. You're in the press box. Uh, welcome back uh, to the program. Uh, we are here, and uh, let's check in with Ralph in South Carolina. Hello, Ralph. Hey, what's up? How are you? I'm good, sir. The reason I'm calling is I just wanted to uh, let you know today I've, I've been watching the program, which is nice. Um, I've watched it several times before. But at the end of the day, uh, I find it not really fair and balanced if you – uh, I am from South Carolina. I do want to point that out, but I just don't find it fair and balanced. You know, if I come watch Fox News or something, I want to watch something to show the whole spectrum. And it just seems to me that sometimes uh, you guys are too biased towards Alabama, Auburn, Georgia. You know, it, uh, mostly to the West. You know, you call the East. Uh, Sorry, and I understand that. I mean, Spurrier left. Um, it left us with nothing, by the way, at South Carolina. But at the end of the day, we brought in Muscamp, and we've done a fairly decent job. So my question to you, when will you start treating us like you treat the Alabama Auburn people? 
Well, Ralph, first of all, thanks for uh, watching today. Um, you know, we had Will Muschamp on Friday, uh, and, and I frankly think I have uh, been about as high on South Carolina as, uh, as, as anyone out there. I, I've even given them a chance of beating Georgia. We, we, you know, as far as you know, picking and choosing, I'm, I, can't, I, I mean, I agree. Uh, Alabama is a big topic of conversation here. I wouldn't ever deny that. Uh, you're a smart guy. You can see for yourself. But we, we've spent a lot of time talking to Don Staley. We talked to Frank uh, countless times during the season. And, and Will Muschamp uh, is always kind to uh, come on uh, and be with us. And we also had a reporter on previewing the the, the spring game. But but by and large, uh, you know, I think we get a fair amount of South Carolina calls. But But in terms of what we set out to do, we try to cover uh, what's in front of us. This week we, we have a couple of spring games. So we talk to Coach Luke. We'll try to talk to others. Um, but it's difficult uh, to control what people call in saying uh, in relation to uh, their, 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 their favorite teams. And, and I'm not, uh, I realize this is called the SEC Network for those watching on television. Uh, and we do our, our best to, to look at the league very broadly, but we really don't have a lot of control over the callers. I understand that, but I, I've been watching today, and the only people you really talk about is Kentucky, mm-hmm. Alabama, Auburn, Georgia, Florida a little bit, a little bit about us. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, excuse me, uh, Arkansas and Ole Miss. Yeah. I mean, I, do you think that's fair? Hey, you know what? I, we actually have done. We've covered more teams than I thought we had, uh, Ralph. Um, I, I, I can tell you, uh, we here, and, and, and I, I realize you've got other things to do, but and I'm not just saying this to say it. But we do hear from a fair amount of South Carolina fans. Uh, now, it depends on the week, depends on the day, but. I, I hear from a lot of fans, and, and, and I'll just tell you, since we are talking, I'm really high on South Carolina. I think uh, I said in an interview uh, Monday that got picked up in a couple of places that I think uh, nine, or ten, nine or ten wins is very doable, and I think beating Georgia is, uh, is at least in the conversation. I saw that. I, you, know, you, you know, I appreciate that. To be honest with you, aren't you in Charlotte? I am, yes. Okay. So that, you know, that's the reason I, you know, I believe no, that. No, listen, uh, Ralph, I, 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 when I lived in Birmingham, I'm not telling you I understood South Carolina as well as I do now because I didn't know Spur- Spurrier very well. Um, but living here, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm surrounded by Clemson and South Carolina fans. So I get, I get what's going on, and, and I appreciate you calling, and uh, I'll do my best to, uh, to try to uh, broaden the base. Uh, uh, you better believe it. Because all I'm asking for is a fair, you know, uh, strike against. I, I will tell uh, you this: I've got a neighbor, Ralph, who's a Clemson fan, and I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed walking around the neighborhood this year as opposed to last year. <laughs> okay. I mean, uh, I don't have to hear about beating Alabama anymore. Well, I mean, I'm just yeah. You know, I understand you. That's where you grew up at, and I appreciate that. But it okay. seems like your program has gone far. I don't know, left or right, you know. I, I hear you. That's fair. You know what I mean, Ralph. Thanks for the call. Look. By the way, by the way, I grew up in Memphis, uh, um, and went to school at Tennessee. But you know, I I, I don't I I, I want to say uh, in terms of fans of all, all we, we have we have people watching the show all over the country. Uh, we have people listening to it all over the country, and we try very hard to to cover the news. But we don't set out every day and say, okay, we have to take a call from Alabama, a call from Missouri, a call from Arkansas. Uh, that, is now how, that is not how a successful talk show operates. So I, I get if you're a fan of some school and you don't hear your I – mean, you have a 30-minute drive on the way home, you're listening to us on, on ESPN Radio or Satellite Radio or your local affiliate or you got home at 5 o'clock and put us on, uh, I realize you, you may have missed it. Um, but but I also understand um, Alabama has won five of the last nine national championships. Uh, this program, before we came here, was based in Alabama, where we, I think you can imagine, we had a pretty enormous listenership. So we took a lot of those folks with us. But, uh, I mean, we're not, we're not looking to shut anyone down. We're looking to... Uh, open up the 10. In fact, it, it, I frankly think we hear from more Georgia fans than anyone. 
uh, and, and, and that would go for lately as well. But uh, thanks for the call anyway from uh, South Carolina. And uh, let's check in with Petey in Louisville, which is in Kentucky, by the way. Hello, Paul. How you doing? Petey, how are you? I'm good, my buddy. Thank you. I have a question for you. I know basketball season's over. It is. And and uh, I'm a, I was born in Lexington. I'm a big UK fan. But uh, the Coach Cal thing, I'm still, the jury's still out on that. But uh, a few years ago, he made a statement about he's really not concerned about the flags. He's more concerned about putting the players in the NBA. What is your thought on that, my buddy? Well, let me, uh, I want to say this about, about John Calipari. I know him well and, and admire him greatly, but I think that is a uh, blatantly uh, wrong thing to say. I think it's pretty obvious he's saying that, uh, pandering to recruits. Um, but to me, your job as, as a basketball coach or football coach is, is number one, to uh, – you know, bring bring honor and, and, and respect to you to your program, but to try to win championships, not to try to uh, make your players millions. Of, they're they're going to make that money anyway. Okay, um, I agree. And, and I, I, just, I just don't. I, I don't think the NBA draft is the most important thing to a college basketball program. I think I think cutting down the nets on on the on the final Monday night of the season is. I agree one hundred percent, and uh, I know he does a great job. Oh, he's a fabulous coach. The, as a fabulous coach, but Pa, oh, I just don't see him winning the big, the big well, flag. Well, listen, um, and no, you know, I mean, facts are facts. He's won one championship. What's he been there? Nine, ten years. Yes, uh, sir. He's had the talent. I don't think he had the talent this year, um, but I bet he's had the talent to win it seven or eight times. I agree 100%. Paul, I appreciate you taking my call, and you. you have a great night, and your your show's the bomb, buddy. Thanks a bunch. Appreciate it very much. Uh, by the way, uh, he had he, he had the talent this year to get to the Final Four, though, based on, on, on how that, that regional worked out, though. I mean, he certainly uh, – I don't think he could have beaten uh, Villanova, but uh, I think they could have gotten to the Final Four very easily had they uh, kept themselves together that night. Um in Atlanta. Let's uh, continue more calls. Russ is in Americas, and you are on the air. How are you, Russ? I'm doing fine, Paul. How are you? We're doing great. Thank you. Well, well good. I sure do enjoy uh, listening to your show every day and watching you on TV. Well, thank you. Uh, it's a little bit better. It's a little bit better when you have Laura on there. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I have. Uh, I have sent her. Uh, I sent her ten dollars the other day. Said, "Well, could that persuade you to come back?" But she said, "It's not enough." <laughs> Well, look, I'm a, I'm a big UGA fan, have been all my life, and I just want people to know that uh, Matt and Daryl are kind of an exception, and uh, the way you handle Harley, your uh, your your comments to him were, were dead on. I mean, uh, Georgia people are, are good people. We respect Alabama, I guarantee you that, and Nick Saban is probably the best coach, uh, maybe of all time, so... Uh, we definitely respect him, and Georgia fans, on average, were good people. But I wanted I man to know that really Georgia doesn't even consider Auburn a rivalry much anymore because <laughs> Mark Rick, Mark Rick pretty much owned them, and Kirby's doing about the same thing now. But we're proud of our program, and uh, hopefully we can get to where Alabama is. I don't know if anybody. Will ever get to where Alabama is uh, uh, because there'll, there'll never be another Nick Saban. But uh, anyway, that's all I wanted to say, and I appreciate it. And uh, it was good talking to oh, you. Oh, thank you very much. It's kind of you to call. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, we are up against a break. We still have 45 minutes uh, or so before we say good night uh, on this Tuesday. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Welcome back in. Uh, Barry is up next. Uh, he is in Georgia, and welcome to the show, Barry. Hey, Paul. I just want to let you know I went to the practice round yesterday, and Amen Corner is in full bloom. It is absolutely beautiful down there. Yeah, year. I couldn't believe it. I was talking to Mark today. We were watching the coverage because uh, I've been there many years, as you probably have, when, unfortunately, there aren't any flowers. They hit it right on yeah. the nail. Yeah, it's, it's, it's early this year. It's my third time going. I went my, took my father-in-law, who had never been, so Checked it off one of his bucket lists, but we sit, we were sitting there at sixteen for hours. And oh, that's a great I came, haul! I, I came across. Uh, we were sitting right by the front bunker there under a tree, 
and I ran across one of the young ladies that participated in the drive, chip, and putt thing. And I was talking to her and her family. And what an experience she had, I mean, to – Oh, that's great. Gl- and she, she said she met – like, she was dropping names. Like, oh, yeah, I hung out with Sergio. No. You know, and, oh, that, you know, uh, that, that's funny. Uh, I have a one of my neighbor's uh, daughter uh, – I mean, uh, was in that as well Sunday morning, and uh, that is that that had to be uh, an incredible experience. No doubt, she said. She said that after she did her first chip, you know, all the cameras were going off, and people were clapping and everything. She said she was shaking so bad. And I looked at her dad. I said, "Well, was dad shaking?" He goes, "Oh yeah, I was shaking." As bad as <laughs> I bet. Was. But but what an experience for it, you know, for anybody. I mean, hell, somebody. I'm 56 years old. That'd be a lifetime experience for me. But for this 14 year old young lady. And all those kids that did that, it, that's just something, you know, they'll, they'll have for the rest of their lives. I just think that's such a great program. And, uh, but it, like I said, the course is beautiful. It's going to look great on TV. I'm not sure Tiger's going to have the, the game. That's so what, uh, other than, uh, other than 16, which if you've never actually been there, it's one of the prettiest holes in golf. What right. else did you, what else did you see? Let's see. We, we, we came in, I, we didn't do a lot of walking just because, you know, my father-in-law's you know, a little bit older. So we sure. kind of, we walked down Amen Corner and we, we, we started at 11. Then we walked across and saw to 12 and then we cut across through uh, 15 and went to 16. And then we were cutting back across when Tiger and uh, Freddie teed off at one. And there was like a thousand million oh, people yeah. following Tiger. But uh, the place is absolutely beautiful. Everybody there is, is super nice. The, the new uh, gift shop they got there allow yourself an hour just to get in the door oh wow and then yeah i mean it, but it, it it's i mean this is beautiful i mean i've been a couple of times this is the most beautiful i've ever seen it and uh it's gonna look great on tv well barry i'm really glad you made it uh, i'm sure your father-in-law appreciated it well thank you so much for sharing that sure. with us and if and anybody out there that's in golf and you've got kids get them involved in this drive chip and putt thing because it, it builds it teaches them a lot about life and every kid I talked to, I talked to about three or four of them that had the hats on. They were all so well mannered, so respectful, and so well spoken that uh, there might be hope for this country yet with kids like that running around. Boy, that's, that would be nice to hear. Hey, thank you very much, all Barry. Right, Paul. Thank you. Great to hear. That first trip to Augusta is amazing. John is in Rochester. Uh, you're on the air. Go right ahead. Hey, Paul. It's John. How you doing? Wonderful, John. Thank you. Uh, always enjoy the show. I've got to let you know that. Glad to hear. Thank you so much. Um, I was watching yesterday the pregame uh, for the championship game, and something rubbed me the wrong way. Um, Seth uh, Greenberg was uh, uh, commentating, and one of the guests was, uh, oh, my God, Desmond Howard. Oh, wow. And Seth started teasing him uh, about him not wearing uh, a Michigan basketball shirt because he wore a Michigan alumni shirt. And Desmond's response was uh, like he was a bigger fan than everybody else there because he was he graduated from Michigan. Oh wow, good for him! Yeah, and that's what, yeah, it. Kind of rubbed me the wrong way that he, he was bigger than all those other people that you know spent big money. You know, uh, be, you know, John, I'm bigger fans. I don't. You know, I, I I know obviously I know Desmond, and you know I'll leave what he said to Desmond, but. I've had this battle with fan bases over the years, um, and again, I, maybe it's, it's personal to me because this this audience that we have, uh, there's no requirement that you show your degree uh, at the door. And you know, I've always argued with uh, the folks that sit in the uh, in the president's uh, box and and the luxury boxes that it, it, without the the fans that that show up at a day game or a scrimmage. Without the fans who uh, go to the crummy games because they can't get tickets to the good games, there wouldn't be these football programs. And it just drives me out of my mind to 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 hear the elitism because I graduated and you didn't. I mean that that is that is outrageous. I mean we all uh, I've experienced it in my own family, and you probably have too. There are a lot of people that don't have the opportunity to uh, to go to school. Uh, they have to work. They don't have the, the financial uh, well-being. And, you know, for anybody, whether it's Desmond Howard or, or someone else, to talk down to fans because they didn't graduate is outrageous. Oh, it was uh, it was very offensive the way he said it. I couldn't, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm a, a huge Alabama fan. And uh, the way he said it was, I couldn't imagine, you know, him just losing some fans that it was kind of like, 
hurtful. I'm like, come on. That's yeah, not again, line, and, and let me. I mean? uh, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not alibying here. I didn't hear it, so I'll trust you. Uh, and, and and you know, he's entitled to say whatever he wants, but uh, so am I. So am I. And yeah, yeah. Uh, I just uh, I have I have that's always irritated me. And, and again, uh, I want to make it clear that the. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I we you know through this program we've gotten to meet so many fans and that you know they they, they, they support a team whether it's South Carolina or Clemson or uh, Alabama or LSU or Texas A and M or or any school for that matter um, right. because they care about that school and 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 whatever the and I, and I, is. I just don't think uh, having a degree hey, it's great if you have a degree good for you um, but that doesn't have anything to do with uh, fan support. Right. We, uh, I've converted my wife. We were in upstate New York in Rochester where there, you know, as a kid, there was no team. Sure. And I converted my wife since I was a young child. And, uh, when, when I got married, she became a Bama fan. And we were in London and she got so excited. She saw somebody with an Alabama shirt. She ran up to him and said, roll tide. And him not even responding, roll tide. He's going into the story that he went to school there and ran track in 67, you know. For as long as I've known, everybody responds with "roll tight," and he wants to tell the story because he went to school there. You know, I'm like, "Come on, got to turn my wife off with that." You know. We have a Rochester guy in the uh, producing booth. Uh, he's he's. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Hey, Mark, yeah. who who if you if you live in Rochester? Hi, John. How did you end up a Bama fan in Rochester? Well, ever since I was a little kid, uh, I don't know what. Yeah, the, the answer, first, Mark, uh, is that John is smart. <laughs> No, I mean, uh, John, John, let's, let's talk here for a second. How old are you, John? I'm 52. 52. So Bama, Bama games weren't regularly on in Rochester. You had Michigan, Notre Dame, Syracuse, Pittsburgh. Uh, uh, Mark, that's why I became a Bama fan. <laughs> no, they had them on every now and then. It was on, and I don't know what came first. I remember being fascinated with every other letter being an A when I was a kid. My favorite color is red. My favorite elf, uh, animal was an elephant. It just, I, I can't remember. I remember crying when they, you know, leaving school when they lost that Notre Dame championship game is the first memory I have. And just going home crying, and that's the first one I have. I don't know how my dad wasn't Bama. I just, I don't that's just how it happened. All right. See, yeah, see, story. see, Mark, and, uh, uh, Mark, John Smart, he became a Bama fan and has celebrated countless national championships. You became a Notre Dame fan, and uh, have you guys won a national championship in your lifetime? One? One. One real one. Yeah. Yeah, that was a painful one when I was a kid. I remember leaving school. Uh, what, 73? out the next day. What, the 73 one? Yeah, the... Uh, hey, Mark, we don't, we don't need yeah. to go through what? your I, anti I, I, Bear Bryant vitriol here, okay? There's no anti. Hey, I Paul, just interesting story. That guy that kicked the field goal for Notre Dame, he was a McQuaid graduate this with a school in Rochester. Oh, really? Very popular school. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. He was in a quite uh, a private school that we have in, in our area that's uh, big on sports, and he was uh, he's the one that kicked the field goal to beat Bama. Yeah, I don't want to hear the winning about field goal. It. Hey, thanks, Sean. <laughs> thanks for your time and your input. I appreciate it. Smart guy, Mark. I'm sorry. Uh, Ty is up next. What do you say, Ty? Hi, Paul. How you doing, buddy? We are doing well, Ty. Thank you. Hey, I'm glad to hear. Hey, I'm going to say something about Alabama. I grew up behind the shoes of John Lasso and uh, Gary Rutledge. And I was at that game at Woodlawn mm-hmm. at Bigger Fields. Wow. That was a game. Pretty famous game. Very famous game. I was in the league, but I played ball into high school. I had to give up one or the other. Motocross for that, I started one way. So I ain't going to say another. But anyway, I love your show, man. Hey, and uh, what do you think the SEC is going to be able to do this year again, as usual? Well, I mean, I, I think it's going to be a big year. Uh, I think clearly the uh, the top two are going to be the, the obvious ones, uh, Georgia and Alabama. And then after that... Uh, of course, of course, of course, they them two. He's smart. He's smart. Oh, he is. He, he really is. But but I, I think, there'll, I think you know, the, the, there's always the chance of a surprise team, and I think it, who will that be? Uh, there, there's always... That, that team comes every year, Ty. Hey, thank you for the call. Appreciate the... Uh, 
the uh, story there. We are up against a break. More of your calls at 855-242-7285. We're coming right back. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. You're not worth a thrill. March means one thing. Basketball, basketball, basketball. Did you know that college players born in North Dakota are historically the most accurate three-point shooters? The NCAA is using Google Cloud to turn data into insights, and so can your business. See how at g.co slash March Madness. Google Cloud, the official cloud of the NCAA. You know, I don't know about you, Larry, but I I didn't hear a lot of love for the Crimson Tide from uh, Rochester Boy, did you? No. You know what? Uh, You talking about Rochester Boy? You talking talking about about, I'm talking about Kubiak. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, uh, yeah, uh-huh. I ain't got started on that Yankee doodle yet. You know, Paul, he corrected you today. Boy, I went out on the river to go fishing. I was watching a show, and he corrected you on something, what and he say? got all smirkingly. He just got up there like he was the smartest person in the room. What about it, you know, was good, la- He was laughing at you. He, uh, Mark Kubiak was laughing. I wasn't laughing at him, Larry. What are you talking about? You, you know, at the first of the show, he made a mistake on something. And you said, no. First of all, no, we know Paul doesn't so. make mistakes, and I don't correct him. No, no, listen, first of all, if, you know, it's not so much Mark Kubiak, because uh, Mark is the only one I deal with, but, you know, they they can't give you a chance to recover from a slip up. Uh, you know no. why, you know why uh, Larry? Because they're Yankees. Yankee Doodle, Jack. And they got to immediately like, tell you oh. that they know more than you do. They, we're, because I'm they, a Southerner, they, I'm stupid. Right, they're smirkingly. They get smirkingly after the uh, uh, intelligence, and you're surrounded by. D- uh, d- oh yeah, right no, everybody. There. Everybody that I work with is a Yankee. Oh, I know. You just. I don't know how you. I don't know how I ended up here because I mean, I, I don't. I don't. Nobody here is from my my end of the world. No, and I, I'm so proud that that team really Nova beat Michigan. I, I was thinking about Mark. Smirk up on that, Jack. You know. <laughs> And, uh, Larry, and you know Villanova's in Philadelphia, right? <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't know where they're from. Okay. But, yeah, uh, Larry, but I, you know, Larry, Larry, uh, you know where Philadelphia is, don't you? Uh, it's up north. Just right north of area. South Carolina. It's right, near, it's right near Delaware, New Jersey. Well, I ain't too north. I ain't too bad. But well, how far north do you want to go? I mean, what do you want it to be in Ontario? Yeah, I mean, it's it's not exactly... Maine, Bangor, Maine, but it, it's, it's New Hampshire. It's 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 up there, Larry. Well, but it's also yeah. not Yazoo City, Mississippi. Yeah. Oh my God. Well, it's still a no name team. You never, you never, you ever, been, you ever been to, you ever been to Philadelphia? Yeah, I've been there. Brotherly love my ass. You know what? <laughs> hey, check this out, Paul. Check this out. Uh, that guy, that tall guy with Michigan, uh, that was pushing people around and showing himself off, he reminded me of Mark. When I saw that guy, I said, boy, that is one smokingly a-hole right there. That's okay. Mark Kubiak. Right there, pushing people. You, you, you don't, you don't like Kubiak, do you, Larry? No, he talked trash. <laughs> you just called Kubiak at eight? He dumped, he dumped my buddy's... Uh, Bama Jersey up there, he probably burned it like on a stick, like them crazy uh, p- uh, people that run around protesting. He probably did that out in his backyard, giggling with his little Yankee Tim brothers, you know. <laughs> what, about that that? what about Smirkily? What? Yeah, that's right. Hey, like, I don't, you know, don't hear nothing. Now you're going to go into the uh, mode with that little thing that rolls up in a ball. One of them little... Uh, Fetal positions. There what? you go, Paul. <laughs> Paul knows you. And I think Paul should get a double Big Ten raise. No, I don't, I don't want. I don't want. I don't want a raise, Larry. I don't need that. I, you know. Yeah. You, you know the problem, you Larry. You know the problem with the raise. Still dealing with the same Yankees. I, you got that right, and they smokingly. Boy, that boy yeah. right there smokingly. If yeah. I can meet him, Paul, and grab a hand, just put my grip on him, I get smokingly. I snatch it out of him. But uh, you I know, bet you I would, Larry. You I know what? Uh, I think I could raise some money for you to do that too. Yeah, it'd probably sue me. It'd probably uh, like a well, we make do. sure he signed a, a, a an agreement. Hey, Larry, thanks for the call, Brenda in Atlanta, Georgia, my kind of town. Hey, Brenda. Yeah. 
This for Brenda? Yeah, how are you? I'm good. Uh, I'm just calling regarding the guy from Rochester, New York, and yes. Mark asking how could somebody be from for Bama from upstate. Uh, my husband, late husband, was a diehard Bama fan. He used to wear his Bama garb at Georgia State University in Atlanta long before they had a football team. Oh, wow. He, went, he was from Yonkers, then Brewster, New York, and he went to um, college at Ithaca College. He remembers... Ithaca playing in the Alonzo J. Stag Bowl oh, in yeah. City, Alabama, and he became a diehard Bama fan ever since. Uh, he would wear his G- his Bama um, garb at GSU, and everybody on campus would call him Bama when they would see him. I said, they're going to beat you like a dog. You better quit wearing that stuff. But Bama's hot over here in Atlanta these days. Roll tight. Thank you very much. Uh, Linda is in uh, New York. Uh, hello, Linda. Hi, how you doing? We are great. Thank you for the call. I'm from Rochester. Rochester. We found another one, huh? Oh, yes. I called to reply a little bit on his comments. I would like to say I am a proud graduate of Auburn University, or Ego, and we do not have to recruit people to like our team. And I would yeah. like to give out a big shout-out to the women's softball team. They're having a great year. They are. They really are. So we've had two well, – uh, thanks for the call, Linda. We've had two calls from Rochester tonight. What are the odds of, of that? Uh, um, we get, we're getting more calls from that part of the country. Hold on a second. Mark is in Boston. Now, that is way up there. Uh, hey, Mark. Hey, Paul. How you doing? We are doing great. Thank you. I just want to make sure that people understand that the crimson flag is firmly planted in Boston and these parts. There are a lot of fans up here, including myself and my daughter who's sitting next to me who made it down to the uh, uh, playoffs this year and, and watch, uh, watch the tide stop. Well, I won't call it stopping, but beat Georgia anyhow. Yeah, it was pretty so close. <laughs> just, just want to make sure there are plenty of us up here. Well, I'm glad. Uh, uh, thanks for the call, Mark. I really appreciate that. Yeah, Man, no we, are, we, are blow, we are blowing out the uh, the East Coast tonight. Uh, this is great. Uh, let's talk to Dave, who is in Ohio. Hello, Dave. <laughs> Hi, Paul. Hey, thanks for taking the call. Believe it or not, first time. I, I haven't called a whole bunch of times, but first time I've ever gotten through. So it's, it's truly a pleasure and That's honor great. for me. Glad to hear from you. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm another Yankee, I guess. I never really considered myself as such, but... But no, I just, I, a couple of random thoughts and what really prompted my attempt to call today was, uh, the gentleman that was talking to you earlier from South Carolina that was feeling kind of butthurt because he didn't, he didn't feel like, you know, you favored, uh, a handful of SEC teams. And, 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 and I just want to say that, that again, being from, uh, Northeast Ohio, uh, I'm a product of Ohio State. I'm a, I'm a huge Buckeye fan. Uh, I enjoyed uh, a couple of years ago when Ohio State got to spank Alabama. However, you know, I, I listen to your show. I travel two, three days a week in, in Northeast Ohio. I work for the, the Veterans Administration. But, I, but, it, but I, I listen to your show. I thoroughly enjoy your show. I find you to be pretty darn even about all the topics you discuss. Uh, the other piece of it that I find quite entertaining is, is you know, Larry and Jim and, and Squirrel and and some of your regulars, uh, you know, I, I always enjoy, you know, the exchange between the two. And, and, and of course, Jim is uh, uh guy's psychotic. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but but anyway, it was just honest, honestly, uh, Mr. Feinbaum, Paul, it was just it was a great opportunity. Uh, again, the, the, the guy from South Carolina is what prompted it. But just an opportunity to you don't need my approval. But, but from up here in uh, OH10, uh, you know, I, I, I do. I, I enjoy every opportunity. Uh, to get well, to listen to you. I, Dave, thank you very much. And, and I, uh, you know, I think sometimes uh, people get hung up on the television component here, but we are heard nationally on radio, and I, and, and that was that's the genesis of this program. Uh, well, you do good work. I, I know your uh, your uh, department's been in the news lately, but uh, I guess that's par for the course, huh? Well, you know, it seems like often is the case, though, that you know, mostly it's just the uh, the bad and the titillating stuff that that makes the the news. I, I guess I would be a, a huge advocate. I think uh, 
there in, in every realm of society, you know, there's always room for improvement in, in, in any area. But but I, I, I'm a huge advocate and I'm a firm believer uh, in what we do and care for our for our veterans. I you know I'm a veteran myself and and I think every day. Uh, you know, the majority of us, we're, we're doing everything we can oh, absolutely. Uh, to be advocates and supportive of, of, of those who've served and, you know, and, and, and given of their time. Uh, so I, I, not, not to get off on that tangent. No, but I think it, I think we forget that sometimes, uh, you know, how important that organization is and, and, and the work that they do. Dave, thank you. I really appreciate your call. Hey, thanks so much for taking my call. Have a great day, and, and thanks for what you do. Our pleasure. Great to hear from you. Uh, man, we've been uh, crisscrossing America on this Tuesday afternoon, about to be Tuesday night. We're going to take a break, come back for a few more minutes. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Everyone in the neighborhood knew about Bobby. Bobby, the basketball boy, they called him. Bobby wanted to go pro someday, so he was always out in the driveway shooting hoops. But one day, his mom came out and told him, Hey, your wife wants you to take out the trash? His mom was visiting, and Bobby was a grown man. He had kind of missed his window. Plus, no one had ever seen him actually make a basket. But on the other hand, Bobby had heard how Geico could save him money on car insurance, so he switched and saved. So, it was all good. And we welcome all of you back. Uh, let's grab, grab a few more calls here as we uh, wind it down. Uh, David is in South Carolina. David, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking my call, Paul. Thank you. First of all, Ralph from Clinton, South Carolina, he drew my call just as he did Dave from Ohio. Dave from Ohio, thank you for your service, by the way. You bet. But Ralph from Clinton, South Carolina, please tweet or call back another day. I want to hear your response because i got four staggering numbers I'm going to give you. What is there to talk about with South Carolina football? <laughs> They've been in the conference for 26 years. they played for the SEC one time. They've got four consensus All-Americans in the history of their program. They have one conference championship, and that was when they was in the ACC. So what has South Carolina football done for it to be talked about? You know how many weeks they've been at AP number one spot, Paul, in the history of their program? One. Zero. Oh, okay. I thought there was one. <laughs> Zero times. I'm looking at – all he's got to do is Google Tennessee versus South Carolina football, and he'll see the numbers. I am born and raised in South Carolina 42 years. I'm a Tennessee volunteer for life. There's nothing to talk about with South Carolina football. I've been here my entire life. All they do is groan and moan and whine and complain when they get a call called against them or it doesn't go their way. They're not happy. Now, he's going to call and say, what has Tennessee done lately? Nothing. They've done nothing lately. But if you look at the numbers, the history's there, and there's no history in South Carolina football. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. (laughs) Tennessee and South Carolina, that's a good rivalry in the future. Derek is in Delaware. How are you, Derek? Real good, Paul. How you doing? Oh, we're doing great. Paul, I'm a 1978 um, graduate of Big Good College, University of Alabama. Now it's called Clover House School of Business. I oh, sure. Absolutely. But but um, I live in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. I just want to say that I wear my uh, Crimson Tide gear proudly wherever I go. And um, granted, I'm in. Um, I am not in the SEC in this part of the world, but uh, there's a reverence that you are given when you wear University of Alabama gear. Whether they like you or not, they have to respect you. That's fair. Uh, that is a fair statement. <laughs> but I just thought I'd call him. Thank you very with, much. Uh, great call to from the Northeast. Uh, it's great to hear from you, uh, as always. Uh, Keith uh, is up next in Georgia. As we head back south, uh, Macon, Georgia. Hey, this is Keith from uh, Macon, Georgia. I just wanted to ask uh, Larry from Shelby, Alabama, how much moonshine has he been drinking lately? Because you and I both know that the the referee coming in from the sideline apparently didn't see Jake Crump's head being pushed to the ground by that Alabama player who wanted to fight everybody in the world. Two, that that Georgia player was not offside at the beginning of the third quarter. And at the time, I'm just saying, Larry don't know what he's talking about. He just wants to rub it in on Georgia fans and say, oh, we're so stupid. Oh, my God, please, whatever. We really know what, what went down in the Mercedes-Benz Stadium, okay? So what went down? You know what went down. 
It was a former uh, Tuscaloosa lawyer who was one of the referees. Oh, really? I, 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 was, I missed the game. I was out of the country. So uh, tell me more about this. I'm just saying that Larry don't know what the hell he's talking about. He needs to go uh, drinking some more moonshine is all i got to say. Mm. Okay. Thank he you. He needs to drink some uh, Georgia Peach moonshine. You're, uh, you're obviously getting over this game well, aren't you? Nope. Never will. But thanks for taking my call. I'm glad I've aggravated all those tweeters today on Twitter. <laughs> Love you, Paul. Hey, thank you. Great to hear from you. Okay. Man, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, just when you think the you know we're, we're in the doldrums, the night after basketball comes to an end, we put a record show on the uh, books tonight. Uh, hey, thanks. Appreciate everybody uh, being a part of this calm and serene four hours. We are done. We will do it again. Tomorrow, the podcast, if you want to catch up on all these great memories, go to the ESPN app and Apple Podcasts. Thank you for listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. The Paul Feinbaum Show airs weekdays on the SEC Network, beginning at 3 Eastern.